Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all can see me and hear me fine. Um, so we have a very, um, we still have some participants waiting to come in, but um, I guess I'll just start now. So good afternoon. Thank you for joining the Sydney CUHK SDGs Joint Workshop on Food Security and Climate Change. Um, we have a long, but very interesting and full program today for you. We will begin with a welcome remark from our host today, Professor Hon Ming Lam and Professor Brent Kaiser, followed by talks given by our researchers on crop genomics, legume production technologies, and soil resilience. There will be discussions on funding opportunities, as well as potential collaborations between the two universities. And after the workshop, we will send you a follow-up survey to gauge your interest in collaboration in the future. So without further ado, I now pass the stage to Professor Lam and Professor Kaiser. Please. Professor Kaiser, you start first, please. Please unmute uh, yourself, Brent. Sorry. So uh, thanks, Professor Lam. So before we begin our meeting, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognize a continued connection to land, water, and culture. So I'm currently on the land of the Darwell people, and we have people from the Gadigal region as well here um, in Sydney. And I pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. And I'd further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country of which we are on and pay respects to their elders past, present, and future. So uh, I'd like to just welcome you all to this really important meeting. This is a, a process that has been going on for the last couple of months to develop a partnership with the Chinese University of Hong Kong and to share some uh, joint interests in um, agriculture, uh, food production and sustainability and, 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 and how to balance all of those different activities on the planet. Um, so we have a, a great list of speakers today that uh, represent various areas of research expertise and capability uh, at both locations. And, um, and hopefully this will encourage um, some new ideas, some collaborative re research activities, some partnerships uh, with, at the educational level as well as the research level that will bring our two institutions closer together and, and uh, solve some of these sort of global challenges we have in front of us. So I'll pass on to Professor Lam. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, the, dear Professor Kaiser, colleagues of the University of Sydney and the Chinese University of Hong Kong, researchers, ladies and gentle, gentlemen, this is my great pleasure to welcome you to the SDG themed webinar workshop titled Partnership for Seal Hunger and Response to Climate Change, jointly hosted by the Sydney Institute of Agriculture and our state laboratory at CUHK. This is a cross-boundary, multidisciplinary communication platform aiming for high-level scientific exchange, pledging for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This workshop is possible with the de dedicated help from the staff from both uh, universities. So as you may well aware, we are in the midst of a global climate crisis where the climate emergency does not stop at the borders. 17 sustainable development goals have been called for the action by all countries in the global policy to promote economic growth while protecting planetary health. It is time now for international collaboration and coordination to develop joint action and new strategy for prosperity that comes along with the preservation of our environment. So to address the global challenge of food security and climate emergency, we have to be innovative, forge new partnerships, and leverage sustain, sustainable resources to fulfill the core mandates of the SDGs. Last but not least, thank you all for taking time for the webinar today. And we would also like to express our appreciations for everyone who make this happen. So I uh, wish today to be fruitful and successful. So for since there's a for sure introducing all the speakers, so I believe that we are not going to spend time to introduce the speaker to you, to you. After the two presentation sessions, there will be a roundtable discussion, first on a joint grant possibility and also future collaboration, including possible joint publications. I hope that all of you will stay. 
and I will start the first session soon. But uh, maybe I should um, leave out some um, uh, principles. So we, in order to have all the speakers have fair time to speak, please keep your time. So I will remind the speakers eight or 10 minutes uh, after, after they start to talk so that they will leave some time for the discussions. There will be a total of 15 minutes for each speaker. And for those who would like to ask questions, uh, our plan is like that. So you can start to type in your question to the chat box so that uh, we can uh, group the questions together and ask the speaker for you so that we can save time and entertain as much question as possible. So for all audience, if you have any question, you don't have to wait, just type in the chat box. Uh, I will monitor it and in this session and we'll uh, channel it to the speakers. Okay, so uh, let's keep the time. So the first speaker for today is Professor Ting Gong Chen from School of Life Sciences, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So Professor Chen, please. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? No. Let me try again. Oops. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Lam, so for the uh, for the introduction, and Professor Kaiser, uh, all the friends in uh, Sydney, and um, um, and everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so I will um, talk about my work um, on applying agricultural genomics um, in the. In the as uh, um, in the soybean research and uh, how we go from a soybean uh, into recently on the uh, other uh, often legumes. So, uh, uh, it's uh, just just to uh, quickly uh, introduce a uh, soybean that uh, it is uh, really uh, important uh, food uh, in uh, in the. Uh, many countries in Asia, in China, Japan, Korea. So it is a, a very um, uh, economically important crop. And it is also an uh, environmentally friendly crop uh, because uh, we know that uh, as a legume, uh, it can uh, fix uh, nitrogen uh, in, and that uh, it, it could uh, reduce the use of uh, artificial uh, fertilizers that is uh, known to uh, contaminate underground water and uh, contribute to uh, PM2.5. And in particular, we are interested to tap into the, the, the genetic resource in the wild uh, soybean germ plasms because uh, it can uh, grow on the marginal lands uh, and to uh, improve uh, soil quality. So uh, we believe that uh, uh, tapping into the advanced genomics uh, technologies are crucial to uh, meet uh, this uh, challenge. And that uh, part of my work uh, is uh, research interest is to uh, develop a genomic technology. So. Uh, as uh, I, I uh, back in uh, the days when I was uh, still a postdoc, I was uh, involved in the co-development of the prototype technologies of a method known as uh, optical genome mapping. As uh, shown here, the um, it is a uh, simple approach as uh, to uh, prepare DNA and then specifically label it at uh, uh, throughout the genomes and to load on to a a, a chip. So the um, uh, then the uh, by applying this uh, labeled DNA onto the uh, nano channel, uh, which uh, uh, with an uh, electric field that can uh, uh, drag the, uh, and draw the DNA into this uh, nano channel, the DNA can be uh, linearized, and uh, this allows us uh, to uh, take a high throughput uh, image uh, uh, in the automated manner. So back back then, a uh, part of my uh, my task was to uh, automate this process in terms of uh, capturing the image. So uh, you may ask that uh, this is just a, um, a rather low resolution uh, approach, but uh, what it could be used for. Uh, in fact, it is a very um, powerful technique because of its uh, nature that it can capture very long uh, stretch of the DNA. And when complemented with a uh, sequencing data, well, we could um, make use of uh, this um, information. Uh, so 
as uh, I mentioned that uh, throughout my uh, 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 part of my research career, I was uh, involved in the development of uh, many uh, the essential methods to make use of this uh, data. And so um, uh, as uh, one example, the first uh, that uh, I, in uh, collaboration with Professor Lam, uh, uh, we construct the uh, reference grade, the wild soybean genome for the uh, uh, the first one uh, that is uh, available, published in 2019. And uh, we are glad to say that uh, even now, uh, it is still uh, one of the best uh, uh, genomes uh, available for soybean. And uh, the important aspect is that uh, it is the uh, the 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 wild uh, uh, joint plasms. So um, the other one that uh, was uh, has been available is the uh, cultivar uh, soybean line that is uh, known as a William eighty two here. That uh, 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 what we have been uh, trying to understand is the uh, in terms of the domestications, uh, in terms of the genomic differences, how the the, the kind of uh, genes that are uh, contributed to the uh, the very different uh, traits and that uh, to tap into these uh, uh, genetic resources. Uh, for crop improvement. But then, of course, uh, having a very complete genome is uh, only the first part of the uh, uh, solution. But we also need to get a uh, high quality annotation as well. So uh, before the, our, um, uh, our work, there has been a no, uh, the, the, for example, the genome, annota genome annotations has only been uh, focused on the protein coding gene. So uh, we also developed uh, methods to uh, um, look into the long non-coding RNAs and also uh, small peptides. And uh, we identified that, that they are uh, 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 small peptides that are actually coded from the so-called long non-coding RNAs. Uh, so suggesting that uh, the, our understanding is uh, still uh, 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 more more uh, studies are still needed. Uh, in addition to the uh, wild uh, soybean uh, genomes uh, assembly, we actually look back into the uh, the cultivar genome. So it has been uh, available for more than ten years before the publication of the wild soybean genome. What we found is that uh, uh, by uh, using the optical map the data, uh, data uh, we could. Uh, um, just by applying on to the existing sequence data, we could uh, drastically improve the, the completeness of the uh, cultivar gene, uh, soybean genome. In addition, during that uh, analysis, uh, what we find is that when we compare the sequence data with the optical map data, we find a uh, lot of uh, discrepancies, suggesting that there are um, many uh, possible uh, misassemblies, uh, which are later confirmed, and that uh, we uh, presented the information to our partner at the USDA, and that, uh, and later on, uh, uh, we, they incorporated this information in uh, making the new, the latest version, which is known as version four, and that uh, as again uh, released and made uh, available to the research community. So, uh, 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 so it, it shows that uh, we could um, uh, make use of these. Uh, um, latest uh, method in uh, improving the uh, uh, the the information even it has been published and made available but uh, so uh, right now uh, optical mapping um, not sure if uh, any of you know that it has now been incorporated in almost any other uh, genome project so uh, which is uh, now a, a a part of uh, 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 technology in being incorporated in, in, in the genome sequencing projects. But what we are uh, more interested in is that uh, we could uh, make use of this uh, information because of its ability to study the very large stretch of uh, genomic sequence. We could uh, study the structural variations, particularly those that are very large, um, uh, that will be usually difficult to uh, we solely relying on the sequencing data. So this is just one example that uh, the study that uh, uh, I collaborate with Professor Lam that uh, showing that, that there is a, this a copy number increase 
in the、uh, cultivar soil bean genome. So in the wild, it is a, this is W O five. There's only just just a one copy, but、uh, there are multiple copies along in the、uh, domesticated soil bean. And these are genes are、uh, encode the、uh, the G A oxidase genes that are known. Uh, uh, shown that、uh, the increased expression of it is、uh, contributes to the 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 reduced、uh, shoot length. So as a、uh, Uh, a、um, one of the traits、uh, shown、uh, being seen in the cultivar soil bean.、Uh, so uh, having uh, these uh, technologies uh, is uh, important, and that uh, we uh, another im important、uh, is that、uh, to continue to、uh, look into the the resources, the wild soil bean resources, and、uh, we are lucky to have. I think one nine minutes. Just remind you. Okay. okay. We are、um, uh, fortunate to have the、uh, collaborations from uh, with uh, Professor Zhong uh, at uh, uh, Chunan University in、uh, South Korea, who、uh, throughout his、uh, career collected thousands of、uh, these uh, wild、uh, soybean lines, and he、uh, generously、uh, shared with us and、uh, helped with us with the phenotyping uh, and uh, characterize the uh, uh, in looking into the characteristics of these.、Uh, Uh, wild lines, so、uh, we are developing uh, these uh, genomic resources. The importance is that、uh, that could be shared to the community, and uh, with uh, this, uh, of course,、uh, it will be important to uh, gen uh, construct a uh, uh, portal that uh, combines uh, these uh, genomic informations,、uh, phen phenotype informations, and that. Uh, uh, And presented to, as I said, to the community uh, that uh, uh, would uh, uh, make it useful. In addition,、uh, we are also、uh, expanding our reach to、uh, other parts、uh, of the world. Uh, as uh, shown here, this is a, uh, a picture that uh,、um, we traveled to uh, South Africa uh, a few times now. And this is a photo taken in the Eastern Cape、uh, near the、uh, border of uh, Lesotho, uh, the the、uh, inland nations、uh, inside South Africa. And as you can see in uh, this uh, drone uh, photo that、uh, captured in the Eastern Cape,、uh, there is a, a very large、uh, degree of、uh, soil erosion because of the climate、uh, in South Africa that、uh, will have uh, this uh, semi-arid. Uh, Climate that、uh, when it rains,、uh, it rains heavily. But then a lot of the time there is、uh, no rainfall, and that、uh, our collaborator Professor Ludidi, uh, um, uh, with his help,、uh, we are getting uh, this uh, land to start、uh, growing soya bean in、uh, South Africa. So the、uh, one of the attempt is that、uh, there are these、uh, local South Africa、uh, cultivar that is、uh, resistant to fung、uh, fungal infection, but uh, uh, it is、um, uh, non-resistant to to drought. So that、uh, we are trying to combine the, 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 these、uh, lines and、uh, start、uh, growing the in、uh, over there, in the hope that uh, uh, that uh, the grow soil bean that can help the farmers and also uh, uh, improve the soil and、uh, prevent the further soil erosion. These are、uh, the the、uh, efforts are now expanded、uh, to other legumes. Uh, in, uh, we are uh, working uh, with、uh, our our collaborators in the US and in Australia as well to、uh, study the,、uh, the 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 genomic characteristics in、uh, other grain legumes, and、uh, that is、uh, ongoing. And、uh, finally,、uh, with uh, all these uh, uh, technologies available at our hands and that、uh, the know how, we are. Trying to expand to、uh, other orphan legumes, and one example is、uh, the lab lab,、uh, because、uh, of its uh, it is、um, native to Africa and、uh, has a huge uh, genetic uh, uh, diversity as well. And our collaborators in UK、uh, have been uh, collecting uh, different uh, lines from uh, different places in Africa. So one now.、Uh, Uh, what is so special about lab lab is that、uh, it is、uh, very drought tolerant,、uh, and that、uh, and more common than uh, uh, more more tolerant than cowpea and common beans, which are now more、uh, relatively more widely grown in Africa. 
So for lab lab, there are these uh, varieties, four seed and the two seed, and each will have their own cultivar and wild lines. And suggesting that they are independent uh, domestications ongoing. Right now, there is a, this uh, four seed uh, cultivar uh, just being released recently. And uh, we are uh, working with them to uh, sequence all the wild lines. Uh, and, and hopefully we will be uh, uh, doing just the same thing uh, as uh, uh, our experience, applying our experience in soya bean to, uh, to, onto a lab lab. Uh, of course, uh, this is uh, not uh, uh, soybean and legumes is not the, our only work. As I said uh, before, the, because the uh, optical map can uh, look at the very long uh, stretch of the DNA, uh, one application I'm working on is to make use of it to, um, to uh, study the polyploidy uh, genome, as uh, we know that the polyploidy is common in crops as well. So I work with uh, different uh, groups to uh, apply the technology to uh, study as, for example, the uh, banana, which is a triploid, and uh, it's uh, important that it is uh, resistant to a fusaria, the, uh, the wilt, uh, uh, and also uh, with uh, Japan uh, on the uh, strawberry that is autoploid and other uh, medicinal plants with a pharmaceutical companies in Japan as well. So uh, with that, uh, I would, uh, and my presentation here with the acknowledgement to my students and the support from the state key lab and um, um, the LGC AUE Center. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tengpong. Um, so uh, I received a quick question from uh, Dr. Bushaw. So how much computer resources that it specifically takes to analyze this data? Can it be performed on a desktop? On a desktop, mm, it is possible. But uh, it will be slower. But uh, if it, there there is a um, a server, um, it can be done rather quickly because uh, this is uh, an, uh, as you can imagine, this is not sequencing data. It is uh, uh, pretty much a, a, a bunch of numbers uh, spe specifying the the relative distance uh, between the labels. So um, it it is is um, much much uh, require much less computational power compared compared to sequence data. Okay, so and another question before we end this. So Australia had also has a wide variation of wild soybeans. Have you tapped into these resources? I Professor Lam, do you know? <laughs> I, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know that. So that would be great. I think I think uh, this is uh, definitely uh yeah we, we would love to um especially if it is uh available for sharing to the research community uh, because uh, that is a one one thing that we, we really uh, hope to achieve is that uh, we will make the uh, we will generate high quality information and then the, and the, and the lines and the seats can also be shared to the research community and, and benefit uh, everyone so uh, if it is a if that is a possibility uh, yeah certainly yeah. Yeah, so I think Tang Feng's expertise is in the um, bio-nano, that optical map that will help to build good genome as well as finding large as we. Yeah. So it can, it can be applied for many different organisms. So, so after his talk, I think whoever interested can communicate with him. So the, the, the next speaker, so thank you Tang Feng. So sure. I move on to the next speaker, um, uh, Dr. Richard uh, Trifogen. Uh, from the Plant Breeding Institute, uh, Sydney Institute of Agriculture. Well, he's also talking about genome on a poly polypoid plant wheat, right? So, are you ready, Richard? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lamb. Um, and my talk is going to be a little bit different to Professor Chan's in that uh, I'm not working with an orphan crop, but uh, a crop for which we already have a, la a large amount of genomic resources available. So my talk is going to be a little more practical and how we're using genomics to um, rapidly improve the heat tolerance of wheat cultivars, our major crop, our major grain crop here in Australia. Now, before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge my co-authors, Rebecca Thistlethwaite, who manages the field program, Daniel Tan, the greenhouse work, and uh, 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 partners from Agriculture Victoria who have assisted us with some of the analysis and the Department of Agriculture in Western Australia and a commercial company 
um, based in Western Australia, Integrain. Oops, it's not moving on. Next, there we go. So what we're trying to do basically is manipulate this equation. Now, I'm a plant breeder and uh, for most of my career, I have been trying to manipulate this very equation. It's the rate of genetic advance. If we can increase the rate of genetic advance, uh, we, we will be giving our farmers much better cultivars much faster. And the purpose of, purpose of implementing a genomic selection, I guess, uh, strategy here is to, is to try and optimize this particular equation. And that's made up, we know genetic advance is basically the selection intensity, the accuracy of selection, the additive variance, and the time it takes, the breeding cycle from cross to cross. Now we know with a genomic approach, we're gonna lose out on selection accuracy. We, we just will because we will be crossing on the basis of genomic estimated breeding values. We won't be doing phenotyping throughout the breeding process. All that phenotyping starts at the beginning. But where we hope to, to uh, make the difference is here in the cycle time. So the, the, the breeding cycle is much reduced. And this has led to some significant advances in high temperature tolerance. Now, I've just outlaid our pre-breeding scheme here because this is a pre-breeding scheme. Uh, in Australia, commercial breeding uh, or, the, or the production of varieties for farmers is done in the commercial sector. And in the university sector or the public sector, we now are what they call, what we call pre-breeders. So we develop the germplasm upon which the, the, the breeding companies will base their crossing programs and these sorts of things. So we start with a large training population. Uh, we genotype and phenotype that, an extensive phenotype. This training population, um, our current training population is eight years deep in terms of the phenotypic data um, collected largely in the field. We are very much field focused because that way we are relevant and we have to maintain relevance. We calculate our genomic estimated breeding values, our GBVs, on the basis of that phenotype and genotype. And because we can, we also conduct a genome-wide association analyses to identify what we call meta-QTL. So these are QTLs that are just are always there. Sometimes the signal is big, sometimes the signal is small, but it's always there. And those QTL we're interested in um, recombining as we move through the process. So we then go into a, a recombination. We're recombining the, those genotypes that are most diverse, that have the highest GBVs, but also carry complementary MetaQTL. And we recombine at F4 each, each cycle. So we at F4, we recombine. So we've really narrowed down or shortened the whole breeding cycle. And at the same time, if we identify a line with a high breeding value that's carrying interesting QTL, we fully fix the line using double haploid technology. That gives us a completely homozygous line. Those homozygous lines end up back in the training population, but they also head off for commercial testing. And at each recombination stage, we produce double haploids that combine all that interesting diversity and off it goes for commercial testing. At the same time, we validate the performance. Now, validation is simply correlating our, genomic, our GBVs against actual performance all around the nation. And uh, so we do that at key sites around the nation, but also the lines with high GBVs that come out of our recombination cycles also end up in those validation populations. And our training population is dynamic. We're constantly bringing in new alleles, new diversity at the top, and we're dropping out less interesting materials as we go along. Now, this whole thing, the entire thing, is completely dependent upon an, on accurate phenotyping. You can calculate a GBV on anything. You can calculate one, but we need meaningful GBVs. So we have what we call a three-tiered phenotyping strategy, and we spend a lot of time on the phenotyping these days. The genetic resources are relatively cheap and available. Now, with our three-tiered strategy, we test large numbers of material in the field in dates of sowing experiments. So sown late, you expose the crop to high temperatures. 
we main tubs we, we maintain subsets across years to keep connectivity there statistically we extensively phenotype and genotype these calculate our gvvs we also identify subsets of 200 lines based on diversity and gvvs and they're sown at different locations around australia we call narrabri our northern site that's the red dot on the map there our mother site where we test thousands of lines and historically we have gone to two sites one in southern australia one in western australia to test our subsets to see how transferable is the result that we're seeing in narrabri uh, just recently we've expanded that to more sites around australia and you can see a site up here at the top kind of narrow you're probably wondering why we have a site up in the tropics um, that's because it is in all likelihood a future environment if the most dire consequences of, of or the most dire predictions of climate change come to pass Kananara up here in the north will be very similar to northern New South Wales and Queensland here in the south so very hot high temperatures any any material that we identify in southern Australia that has heat tolerance that carries useful genes that has a high breeding value if that holds up in Kananara then we know this is important germplasm once we've identified lines using this field-based testing we then go to step two which is a controlled environment in the field we use heat chambers to induce high levels of stress in the field and we do that because we don't want to be selecting for lines that are specifically adapted to late planting that's not what we're after we're using late planting simply to identify lines that carry genes that are useful uh, under high temperatures that maintain yield under high temperatures and once a line has been through that field based testing at uh, that field based heat chamber testing it goes to the greenhouse where we confirm the resistance now recently in this current phase of our work we have added an extra step uh, once a line has been through those three steps, we know it's we know it's got a high GBV. We know it carries interesting QTLs. We 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 know that it, uh, it it holds up both in the field, in the heat chambers, and in the greenhouse. It goes for testing at 35 different locations nationally, and that we have managed through a partnership with a commercial company. So this is our strategy. We start in the field with very large numbers of lines. That top photograph is one of our trials, a single date of sowing. That's a 6,000 plot experiment. These plots are 12 meters squared. And alongside it is a later date of sowing just emerging. Um, once a line is identified as having potential tolerance, it goes to, into these, heat, these field based heat chambers. We run them from generators and we expose them to high temperatures and then off to the field for testing later. In season, you can imagine when we are we are running such large experiments, and these are it's important to get that field-based phenotype. Uh, we are somewhat limited in what we can measure on the ground. And we do measure phenology and plant height and disease incidence, but we do use drones to collect imagery. So basically NDVI and canopy temperature. And canopy temperature is incredibly important when it comes to identifying lines that have high temperature tolerance. All of these end up in a weighted index that we use to calculate our GBVs. At the end of the season, we go into these plots and we harvest them all. And there we measure the productive traits, the traits that farmers want to see, the grain yield, the grain weight, screenings, protein, test weight, all of these are economically important traits. And all of that, all of that ends up into, in, into an index that, upon which we calculate our GBV. So yield, kernel weight screenings, canopy temperatures, NDVI under heat stress, but we also include rust resistance because this is the major disease of wheat, major disease of cereals around the world. So that index combines everything and we weight it based on the heritability in any given year. Sometimes the weighting for canopy temperature is high, if the heritability within that year is high. So we, we are not wedded to a particular weighting. It completely depends on what is the heritability in that year. How much of the variance is actually genetic? Which is 10 minutes. Thank you. So we use two models to uh, measure, 
to, to, to estimate GBVs. We have a baseline model that, that basically estimates all the additive effects across the genome, a more sophisticated model that incorporates genotype by environment interactions. And uh, we've been working with the statisticians in Victoria to fine tune these. And of course, the pre predictability then is simply the GBV against the actual performance. Um, our predictability is reasonably high. Now, these are the results for materials trained at Narrabri over, over a four-year period and tested at key locations in Southern and Western Australia. And you can see under optimal sowing where we don't have heat stress, that predictability is pretty good. Anyone who knows plant breeding will know that that's not a bad predictability around 0.4. As expected, under high temperatures, it moves around a bit more, but we are still getting quite a significant predictability. So what we're doing at our mother site in Narrabri is relevant to other parts of Australia, and that is key for our work. Now, we have, a dent we have produced some 7,000 lines out of the recombination cycles in this program over a five-year period. So you can see very, very, we've really truncated that whole breeding process. And what I've done here is summarize um, some of those findings, the GBVs that we've been able to, to develop. Up here, under heat stress, now the orange lines represent the GBVs uh, of lines uh, under heat stress. We've identified materials out of the recombination that have extremely high GBVs. The rest of the lines in this graph are all the Australian currently grown cultivars and their, their GBV. So you can see what we've done is up the game significantly genetically. We now have unique materials carrying unique combinations of genes with really high breeding values for high temperature tolerance. What does that mean? How do they actually perform? What I've done here is I've represented those materials against Suntop, which is the benchmark check in our environment, the one we're trying to beat. And on the y-axis, you have performance against yield as a percentage of that benchmark check under high temperature. And what you note here is that most of the materials with high GBVs are actually above the benchmark check, exactly what we want to see. However, what does a farmer want to see? He wants to see this group over here in the top right-hand corner. So that group is what we send off for commercial testing because farmers want to be protected when the temperatures are high, but when the temperatures are normal, as does happen, they also want high yield. So that's an important consideration. And our genome-wide association analyses have identified a range of very, very important QTL. You can see the chromosomes around the outside here. You can see the traits running through here on this transect. And these QTL are repeatable. They're always there. That signal is there in every environment, really important regions for reassembling this diversity in new material. Um, in terms of areas for collaboration, I know I realize that you know, my, my talk is a little different to Professor Chan's, but I really believe that understanding, more understanding of the genetic and physiological control of high temperature in all crops is needed. We need a, we always need more effective and relevant high throughput phenotyping, better imagery, deeper phenotypes. We need to unravel the interaction between high temperature and moisture deficit. And always we can do better at calculating our GBVs. And on that note, I will conclude um, just acknowledging the primary source of funding for the work the Grange Research and Development Corporation and others who have contributed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I, I saw a question, so I thought this year is about what is due to uh, see is the fossil degree census is noted in April and 49 in May, right? So in uh, conject in Pakistan. So this is a comment. So your research is very important. Yes, yes. Well, interestingly, those temperatures that we see in Pakistan are what we will see in that northern site in Australia, Kananara. That, so in many ways, what, what, what Punjab in Pakistan experienced this year is what we're calling our future environment in Northern Australia. I will have information this year on just how robust our best heat tolerant materials are in that environment. And uh, I'd be very happy to share that with our Pakistani colleagues. I, I myself have a question. So um, do you think that, um, because you're doing genotyping and phenotyping, so do you think that uh, genomic research or the high spectral analysis will be helpful for your program? Oh, de definitely. I mean, you're talking about the, the hyperspectral hyper phenotyping? 
Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. absolutely. Look, one, one, what I see is that we spend a lot of money running a big field-based phenotyping program. And the, there's a reason we do that. It's because the greenhouse does not correlate with the field, okay? So we, st we, we start in the field because then we're confident about our GBVs. We, we plant wonderful field experiments, but we don't get a deep enough phenotype. If we we're able to get a better phenotype, if we had better imagery and better analysis of that imagery, I think we could make uh, a lot more advanced. It means our genomic estimated breeding values would be even more relevant. So yeah. the answer is yes. Good, right? So because I think our state lab, well, on one hand, we, are, we have a lot of experts in genomics. On the other hand, we also have a group who work on spectral analysis, especially the high spectrum, that, that can help to monitor the, the draft or, or even other future status. So we will talk more about possible collaboration. I think, I think we should talk about that. I'd, I'd be very interested. Thank you very much. So Thank you very much. Yeah, so I guess we need to move on to the next speaker. So um, well, we change the topic a little bit. So so we now we're talking more on the on the uh, benefits of the groom itself, right? So the next speaker will be Professor Jack Wong from School of Life Sciences, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So Jack, please. Thank you, Professor Lam. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure and honor to have this opportunity to share our recent work. Thanks first to Professor Lam and Professor Kaiser and colleagues to organize this amazing uh, workshop. And for the friends in Sydney, you're welcome to visit Hong Kong, to visit our LICE campus, uh, when I think hopefully when the pandemic ends. Uh, I also look forward to visiting uh, you guys in uh, Sydney uh, to establish some uh, fruitful collaboration. Just to declare myself, I'm not a plant or crop scientist. Instead, I'm a, a kind of a physiologist uh, trying to understand the cardiovascular benefits or some health effects of some uh, crops, uh, in this case, in the legumes. Um, so let's get started. Uh, why the cardiovascular health? So as you know, cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause of death globally. It, can, uh, it is the number one uh, killer in the world um, and, and it kills many people in the world. And among the leading cause of death globally, you can see uh, cardiovascular diseases like the ischemic heart diseases and stroke are ranking number one and number two, the causes of causing the number of, uh, most number of deaths in the world. So metabolic, uh, within the cardiovascular diseases, metabolic syndrome, okay, is a major risk factor for the cardiovascular diseases, which is characterized by high blood glucose level, the dyslipidemia, the the dysregulated uh, lipid uh, pro, uh, plasma lipid profile, obesity gaining uh, body weight, and hypertension. And you can see that in this uh, diagram, the, uh, with the patient with the diabetic mellitus, the DM, actually they increase the risk of the cardiovascular by almost two times. And there are many of the diabetes uh, complications that occur, including eye diseases, kidney diseases, diabetic food, uh, neuropathy, and the brain diseases, new degenerative, uh, new problems. So man, and, and for the cardiovascular diseases, indeed, uh, for the atherosclerosis, they, it lies at the center of the cardiovascular diseases. Atherosclerosis characterized by the layering and the hardening of the blood vessels, and usually occupied, uh, the, the vascular lumen is occupied by the, um, uh, atheros by the plaque formation. This, disease, atherosclerosis, actually occurs in more than 40% and develops subclinical atherosclerosis at the age of 60. Usually, atherosclerosis is a silent killer uh, in which we usually, at the early beginning, it is asymptomatic until when it becomes symptoms. When there, there are symptoms, it becomes life-threatening. So therefore, early diagnosis and prevention is very important to prevent this. So this diagram shows a very complicated uh, Diagram, but what I want to bring to your attention is usually the atherosclerosis start with the endothelial injury. Endothelial cell is the innermost nailing, innermost layer of the cells nailing the innermost surface of the blood vessels. So if it's the normal uh, blood vessels, usually you can see that endothelial cells is actually very nice. They are they actually help to protect our vascular function. But when they, whenever there is some injury to the endothelial cell, it will cause endothelial dysfunction. In which case, this is actually very detrimental and cause the atherosclerosis problem. 
from the data in the um, in just last year in the 2021 update, um, you can we can see that uh, usually at the uh, for those usually the female actually has a lower incidence of the cardiovascular risk than male until they reach the it reaches the um, postmenopausal stage. And you can see from this uh, from the panel, from the diagram on the right panel, uh, and the filial function is also impaired significantly during the menopausal stage. So we can see that the brachial artery flow, uh, the flow mediated dilatation, which measure the flow, the, the blood flow in the forearm, actually they decrease from the premenopausal to the early and late to the late postmenopausal stage. So this actually tells us cardiovascular diseases is actually very important and. But we think to treat the cardiovascular diseases or to maintain or to contribute to the cardiovascular health, diet is one of the core factor. And there are many dietary composition and that are related to the cardiovascular health within which soy protein and the phytoestrogen is one of the target I want to share, today, share with you today. But indeed there are a wide variety of the dietary interventions and supplements that can improve the function of the lactic oxide synthase pathway and promote the cardiovascular health. So if you want to understand, uh, learn more about this, you guys, please feel free to read this book chapter. We published a few years earlier. So today's the topic is the legumes. So it has been proposed that the legumes can be served as a functional food for the cardiovascular diseases. So indeed, so you can see that the legumes, extracting the legume proteins or the peptides, they have many, has being reported to reduce many bad factors, including the free radicals, the superosa anions, causing the vasoconstriction, increase, reduce the uh, cholesterol levels, and, and uh, it, eventually it will promote the cardiovascular health. In the proposed diagram here, it also demonstrates there are many beneficial effects of the legumes. But indeed, we can see that with a diet low in the legumes, so it can contribute to cardiovascular diseases, CVD. So the diet low in the legumes, as you, can, as you can see here, this actually can cause some levels of the people die in, in, in our population. So within the legumes, actually today, we talk mainly focus on the soybean and soybean actually has been used um, in the um, traditional Chinese medicine as well. So the, you, for, the, for those who cannot read Chinese, don't worry, but this, I just want you to show you that the, in the traditional Chinese medicine, it also actually demonstrated that the soybean has several functions, including relieving the internal heat or the invigorating the circulation of blood and relieving pain. What is, and with and among the soil in within the soil and the composition of the from the composition of the soil, and one of the important uh, composition is ingredients in the soybean is the soy isoflavones. So isoflavones also called um, soy phytoestrogen. They have antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effect. And the main soybean isoflavone include the genistein, daisin, and the gaisatin. So in this, today's talk, I just want to share some of our recent um, findings uh, to investigate whether the soy isoflavones would benefit the vascular function in the overactive mice, the, the my, overactive mice, mice, the mice that uh, in, the, in which the ovaries are removed and understand the uh, potential mechanism. So due to the limited time, I just put it in a very brief um, graphical abstract here. Uh, we try to understand the soil isoflavones which add on a local mechanism. They add on to uh, reduce the uh, one of the protein, uh, the, the, the biomarkers here, the FKB, FK506 binding protein 5, which can in, uh, lead to a reduction in the reactive oxygen species and uh, and then lead to an improvement in the vascular function. So to start with, so we first introduce this over uh, postmenopausal uh, syndrome in the mice. So we removed the ovaries in these mice and then we treat them for uh, in separate them into different groups. Treat them with the isoflavones at 500 milligram per kilogram for eight weeks. As the positive control, we treat these mice with the estrogen. So the first data we observe is uh, obviously the overactomized mice, as you can see from these figures. So they in increases the body weight, just like in the postmenopausal women, they also have an increase in the body weight. And then after the eight weeks treatment of these isoid isoflavones at 500 milligram per kilogram per day, so the body weight gain actually reduced. The, the, the isoflavone actually indeed 
reduce the body weight gain. And without actually changing much to the uh, uterine uh, 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 weight. So we also actually try to uh, perform the oral glucose tolerance on these different uh, groups of the mice. And we can see that overactomized mice have impaired glucose tolerance. So when we give them this uh, oral the, the glucose and then the, the glucose level actually rise quick, uh, quickly, uh, suggesting that actually it has an impaired glucose tolerance. But the, interestingly, the isoflavones actually can protect these mice from uh, increase by either, or by either increasing their insulin sensitivity to, to lower the blood glucose level upon the injection or administration of the glucose to these mice. So seems that the soy, uh, the isoflavones have some metabolic effect. And we also carry, further carry on to understand, to, to investigate whether the soy isoflavones could reduce the uh, white adipose tissue level and kind of suppress the adipose uh, tissue inflammation. And from this graph, we can see that the overactomized mice, they, uh, they have uh, increased in the body weight. And also they have an increase in the mass of the white adipose tissue. The, and, and in this case, the, the increase in these uh, subcutaneous fat, the perigon, uh, perigonal fat or the perirenal fat in the abdomen uh, area. So they, they were increased or increased in the overactomized mice, which would be, could be significantly reduced by the isoflavone treatment. And uh, if we take uh, this adipose tissue and then extract the RNA, and we can see that this adipose tissue also contains less uh, increase in the uh, CCL2, which is the monocytic attractant protein uh, in this uh, adipose tissue, suggesting that there is increase in the inflammation in this adipose tissue, which could be reversed by the isoflavone treatment. More importantly, we took out this uh, aorta to understand the functional, uh, the vascular reactivity in these um, uh, mice. So from the, in the over, over mice, so we basically in the myograph settings, we contract, we contract these aortas, we extracted, we are isolated from the mice. And then we contract them with the phenylephrine, which is an alpha-1 agen agenergic receptor and agonist. We contract, contract the blood vessels. And then we add the acetylcholine, which is, uh, we add on the muscarinic receptor on the endothelial cells to relax the- Just okay, 10 minutes, so, okay. Okay, mm -hmm. so basically it, it happens for us to understand that isoflavone could significantly protect the uh, vascular function in the overactomized mice, as you can see the significant impairment in the overactomized mice, which could be rescued by the chronic treatment of the isoflavone without affecting the sodium nitroprusa, which is a nitric oxide donor. Uh, they, they, these are similar. So furthermore, we understand, try to understand, uh, look at the reactive oxygen species level, we can see that the isoflavone could inhibit the increased re uh, reactive oxygen species uh, accumulation in the aortic wall of the overactomized mice. And um, to put the story short, basically, um, uh, you can imagine for the overactomize for the postmenopausal women, they have increased in the stress level. And that also actually also apply to our overactomized mice. The plasma, glucocorticoid, the steroid level, cortisol level increased, which could also be suppressed by the isoflavone. Some literature search and indicate that the FKBB5 is increased upon the endogenous glucocorticoid uh, level. And also this paper published in PNAS also demonstrate the FKBB5 upregulation may be a risk factor for the cardiovascular disease. So in our overactomized mice, um, we took out the aorta, we extract this messenger RNA, and we can see that the FKBB5 level is also upregulated in, the, in these aortas from the overactomized mice, which could be prevented by the isoflavone treatment. So if, if, if FKBB5 can indeed help, so now actually, we also actually confirm this by it, by administering, by feeding this SAFIT2, which is a FKBB5 antagonist to these mice. So similar to the isoflavone, we can also see that the, the SAFIT2, which is an FKBB5 inhibitor, can also sufficiently improve the vascular function, improve the glucose tolerance, and prevent the increase in the reactive oxygen species production. This, in this case, we use a cell model. We treat this cell with endothelial cells with the desomethasone, which is the cortisol and then the safety tool 
uh, while the isoflavone could reverse the uh, while, while the uh, dexamethasone can increase the uh, reactive oxygen species in these uh, endothelial cells, both the safe 2 and the isoflavones could reverse this increase in the reactive oxygen, oxygen species level. And finally, so basically what we can uh, ex uh, further do a, a, a messenger RNA, the QBCL, and we show that the dexamethasone can in will increase the FKBB5, which could be reversed by the isoflavone or the safety 2 treatment, and also the ELOX, which is the enzyme that produces the electric oxide. Uh, the dexamethasone could inhibit the ELOX expression, while the isoflavone and the safety 2 can uh, reverse this increase. So finally, to sum up, um, we also try to look at the target, which lead to the inhibition of the FKBB5 by the isoflavone. So one of the target is the microRNA, which can degrade the FKB5 messenger RNA. And we also demonstrate in, the, in, in, the, in this uh, uh, experiment that the solid isoflavone could also uh, increase the microRNA511 expression in this um, uh, animal model, uh, in the, actually in this uh, edible tissue and as well as the uh, aortic aortas, which can reduce the FKB5 upregulation and protect the endothelial function. So in summary, what I want to share with you today is, uh, I want to show that uh, the soil isoflavone could indeed protect the vascular function in the overactomized mice uh, through inhibiting the rocks and the FKB5 levels in the endothelial cells. We also kind of demonstrate a, demonstrate a new way, innovative uh, mechanism to explain the beneficial effect of the soil isoflavones in protecting vascular function. In summary, the soil proteins and the isoflavones can improve the function of the electric oxide pathway and promote the cardiovascular health. So uh, at the end, I would like to take this uh, chance again to thank our director, uh, Professor Lam, uh, and the Stakey Laboratory of the Agro Biotechnology uh, to support uh, this work. And I will also want to thank my, my team uh, for uh, especially uh, Yi and uh, who is a postdoc fellow, and uh, Riffen, who is a PhD student from my group to, uh, do, in doing this work. Thank you all for your attention, and uh, any questions are welcome. Thank you, Jack. So uh, a quick question from Dr. Kaiser. So is there variations in soy isoprepons across soybean varieties? Yes, that's actually a very good point. So um, uh, from different uh, soy Actually, this actually is a good point that Professor Lam is asking me, our, our group, to uh, understand. And it, 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 at this point, actually, what I can tell you is uh, we are collaborating with Professor Lam and we can uh, try to uh, uh, isolate different um, uh, active ingredients from different soybean varieties and trying to look at their uh, difference in the isoflavone, including the isoflavone content. Uh, composition and try to understand what are their effects in the in affecting the vascular function in these different in, dif in these different animal models. Yeah. Thank you, Jack. I, I think Jack has established animal and cell model for bioactive ingredients in any kinds of food. So if you have any of these projects, I think he's the one that you would like to talk to. So to save time, so we have to move on to the next week. Uh, this, this speech. So, uh, P Professor Brands Kaiser from Sydney Institute of Agriculture will give a talk on sustainable protein food. So, uh, Brent, please. Okay, I'll take it away here. Let me just get that on. Can everybody see that? Yes, you can see. Okay, uh, so welcome everyone. So, the title of my talk today is Finding the Pulse of, to Sustainable Protein Foods. And uh, this is a bit of a an applied talk, kind of similar to Richard's a bit, looking at uh, some of the physiology in some of the pulses that we work in and trying to understand their nitrogen use in particular. So this is a field of some chickpea uh, selections growing in Kadanara. Uh, as they're young, they'll eventually fill in those plots very quickly and uh, grow to an amazing level. Um, so as you know, both basically, uh, uh, plant productivity and the food that we eat is really dependent on the nitrogen that uh, we provide in agriculture. There's different forms of nitrogen, of course. There's uh, inorganic and organic forms of nitrogen that are 
delivered to uh, to soils on a daily basis. And um, uh, that nitrogen is really essential for supplying all of the food that we eat on a daily basis, for all the fiber that we actually use to clothe ourselves, and, and a lot of the fuels that we're, we're coming off farms, in particular now biodiesels and, and, uh, and various oils for cooking and so on. So the ability to use nitrogen in an agricultural context is really important, um, and uh, but also challenging in, in many contexts because as we apply inorganic nitrogen onto soils and to, uh, and to produce food, uh, there is consequences to that where by increasing the amount of reduced uh, inorganic nitrogen in the biosphere. And a lot of that nitrogen, if it's not used properly, can contribute to various forms of pollution, such as nitrate leaching into uh, groundwaters, uh, which can occur when you have excess fertilizers that aren't utilized in the soil, or, we, or if you have crops that aren't using that nitrogen effectively at the point of time of application. Or you have uh, uh, situations where you have increased soil mineralization that are contributing to increased amounts of free mobile nitrate. And often that will result in eutrophication pressures on lakes, rivers, and oceans. Uh, and this is a consequence that we see, uh, or an occurrence that we see in Australia quite often, uh, where we'll have uh, significant pollution associated with uh, um, unchecked uh, nitrogen use uh, in association with producing uh, food. And, and one of the other sort of underlying tenets of all this is that, you know, this nitrogen fertilizer can also generate quite a bit of greenhouse gas emissions in the form of nitrous oxide. And so there's a real impact on how we uh, uh, manage our nitrogen use uh, to produce food in a sustainable manner. And this is really in particular important because we are approaching a, a growing global population where we'll need to feed uh, 10 billion people by 2050. And that's going to require about a 70% increase in agricultural production by that period of time. Most of that production is occurring in areas in countries where there is uh, rapid population growth uh, and, and, and often in, in developing countries where they have limited access to uh, fertilizers or the ability to actually produce the food that they need. And if you look at the gap in where that protein that comes from agricultural food production sits at the moment, most countries, uh, most westernized countries have a, a luxurious supply of protein on a, on a daily basis, but many of the countries that have uh, most of the populations on the planet are sitting around, you know, 30 grams per capita per day, less than, than uh, many countries around the world. So there is already a gap of protein availability currently, and this, this, this gap will, will tend to increase over time. So we work in the, in the area of pulses, and we think pulses are a real important sustainable protein source for, for a growing planet. Pulse seeds, as you know, are high in protein. They compose of um, 25 to 45% protein, depending on the type of pulse you grow. Pulses are also a natural source of uh, reduced nitrogen. They fix atmospheric nitrogen that's in the air. So when you grow pulses, you require less nitrogen fertilizers for the production cycle. And those pulses also deliver a lot of reduced nitrogen to the soil for follow-on crops such as wheat, barley, and, and, and canola. So pulses provide a very high quality sustainable protein source if you can grow more of them and, and collectively eat more of them on your daily diet. So at the University of Sydney, we've been working a lot in this area trying to identify mechanisms to improve pulse productivity under Australian-based conditions where we Richard gave you a good, very good example of field phenotyping that we will do in, in, in pulse-based crops, looking for heat and pollen viability, looking for improvements in canopy structure that will give better photosynthetic capacity, looking for very specific biomarkers uh, that can identify yield, drought, and heat tolerance, trying to relate those to phenotypic appearances in the, in the, in the soil profile, and looking at biochemical and, and genetic uh, cues that control photosynthesis, respiration, nitrogen use, nitrogen transport, and so on. Today, I'm going to talk really about um, managing nitrogen access. And so, uh, as you know, legumes can fix nitrogen. They have a, a, a nitrogen-fixing symbiosis with a soil bacteria called rhizobia. And so that's an indirect supply of nitrogen through that uh, legume symbiosis. Uh, other sources of nitrogen for legume productivity or Pulse productivity includes uh, a direct form of nitrogen supply. So that's nitrogen that's in the soil, such as nitrate and ammonium. And that's also nitrogen that is used by non-fixing crops, such as maize and wheat. We're quite interested in how these two systems, the indirect and the direct system, influence how pulses grow. 
and how the interactions between the legume and, and the, in the, in the non-fixing uh, field crop interact to provide a complete uh, growing system. So as you know, if you grow a, a pulse in rotation with a cereal, um, if you grow the pulse prior to the cereal, you'll often get a very significant benefit from all the uh, uh, decomposed and mineralized nitrogen, as well as exudates of nitrogen coming from the symbiotic uh, fixing legume that will support the growth and the, and the productivity of your follow-on crop. So our research goals are really to try to understand, can we increase this fixation process to get more nitrogen assimilation and more yield and quality in, in, the, in, the, in the seed products that come off these pulses? Can we en enhance the fixation process so we get better rotational benefits to the, the growing cereals next to them in the following seasons? And can we make legumes in particularly tolerant of exogenous nitrogen that might be in the soil? And as you know, legumes are very sensitive to high concentrations of nitrogen that's in the soil profile, they will stop fixing nitrogen, they'll stop forming a symbiosis, and they'll become very dependent on what's available in the soil profile. Can we make them more tolerant of that nitrogen uh, that will be occurring in the soil on a natural basis? So we're looking at uh, various sort of research areas, looking at understanding how root nitrate uptake or inorganic nitrogen uptake occurs in pulses, particularly ammonium, nitrate, and amino acid transport systems. We want to understand the indirect nitrogen pathway, particularly how sensitive this nitrogen fixation process is, how efficient it is in capturing the nitrogen that it actually fixes or it's lost into the soil atmosphere uh, or to the biosphere, and trying to uh, encourage nodule nitrogen fixation to occur um, at when soil nitrogen concentrations are relatively high. Or ultimately how to use both forms of nitrogen, both the direct and indirect pathway to maximize productivity and potential seed protein content. So one of our model systems that we've been working with is chickpea because it's, it's one of the largest pulse crops that we grow in Australia. We're the world's largest exporter of chickpeas to uh, countries such as India. And um, from a nitrogen context, chickpeas are rather poor legumes. They don't have the best, I guess, track record in fixing nitrogen. And so, and chickpeas also invest a lot of their nitrogen that they take up into the root system into that nodule symbiosis. About 25% of the total plant N will go into producing and supporting the legume nodule. Other legumes such as soybean, for example, will only invest between five and 10% of their nitrogen uptake or, or, or quantity that they actually have accumulated. So chickpeas generally have a traditionally low seed nitrogen concentration compared to other grain legumes. And so there isn't as much of a driver for taking up more nitrogen or fixing more nitrogen. And can we actually um, answer the questions, is nitrogen fixation, nitrogen redistribution pathway less efficient in chickpea than other grain legumes, which we think it is? And how does the direct or indirect pathways influence um, these two processes? So we've been looking at a number of different types of chickpea varieties uh, that are presently grown in Australia, selections that have come through our breeding programs here in Australia, as well as imports that have come in from India and around the world. And just as a simple look uh, from, um, sorry, let's move this bar here, um, uh, a nitrogen responsiveness. So this is a, a chickpea variety called Hattrick. And this is some work from uh, Zanab Ramad, who a PhD student of mine, who has looked at nodulated chickpea plants and how they grow in the presence of 0.5 millimolar nitrate versus five millimolar nitrate. So these are nodulating fixing plants growing happily. And as you can see, whenever you add a bit of extra nitrogen, not a lot of nitrogen, you can get a stimulation, both root dry weight and shoot dry weight. So the plants are very nitrogen sensitive. They want to actually use more nitrogen if they can, if they can get access to it, more nitrogen than what's actually the nodules actually are delivering through their, their root system. Sorry. Um, if you look at chickpea nitrification with the absence of external nitrogen, this is just a simple, very simple experiment. So over a, a period of time after sowing, nodule dry weight will increase, root and nodule dry weight will increase collectively, and so will plant dry weight. So these plants are responding to that nitrification capacity and, and allowing them to grow. But if you look at the fixation rates in those nodules that are present on those chickpea plants, they start, to they start quite high at the beginning of the plant's growth, but then start to decline very quickly as that plant matures. And so there's this contradictory need of actually increasing the amount of nitrogen fixation to occur, particularly when actually the seeds are developing and uh, are producing uh, or storing protein later in the, the life cycle of these plants.
Runs at 10 minutes. Okay. So if you take those same uh, nodulated legumes and give them a bit of nitrogen, you can also, as I showed previously, you can get a, a, a strong stimulation of, of, of growth in the shoots and the roots. But uh, you also can get a, a depreciation in, in, in the production of nodules as well as a, a reduction in nitrofixation. And we really want to understand why or how we can actually reverse this redu re reduction of nitrofixation capacity, maintain nodule growth, and still maintain a higher growth rate uh, in the plant as it, as it grows. So we've looked at a lot of germplasm and, and compared uh, how they grew and, and how they responded to adequate nitrogen or very low nitrogen with a little bit of extra nitrogen. So in this experiment, we took a number of Kabuli and Desi uh, chickpea limes, compared their shoot nitrogen content with or without nitrogen. And as you can see, majority of the Desi and the Kabuli limes are very nitrogen responsive. They want more nitrogen if you can provide to them, which suggests to us that these plants are growing under their capacity and capability in the field and, uh, and need more access to nitrogen. But if you look at how the, the nodule dry weight responded, they actually are quite small uh, in the presence of that extra nitrogen. So they're very nitrogen sensitive, but the, the nodule numbers, they still nodulate quite well. And, and, and we see in chickpea basically it's a heavy nodulating plant, but those nodules aren't really actually growing and doing much work. And when you look at um, uh, the impact, if you ex add a bit of extra nitrogen to the, to the soil as these plants grow, these plants are rapidly taking up nitrogen and delivering it to the shoots, not to the roots, but actually to the shoots. So there's a, there's a breakdown in actually how that nitrogen is actually getting from the root system to the shoots to support the growth that these plants really want. And when you look at nitrofixation rates, and this is just a, 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 a random selection of Kabuli and Desi lines, you can see that the Desi chickpeas, which is your, your dark, smaller uh, uh, table, uh, table chickpea, have a much higher fixation rate than what you have in the kabulis, which is uh, which you actually use for your hummus and various other types of food products. And um, and but those desi chickpeas are quite sensitive to nitrogen and uh, and will decrease in their functionality very quickly. So we have some paramount shifts in, in the ability to actually fix nitrogen. All of these plants seem to want to respond to nitrogen provision, so they they are hungry for nitrogen, and uh, they need an opportunity to uh, to actually tackle and, and absorb more nitrogen as they grow. So this preliminary data basically indicates to us is that there is significant variation in chickpea nodule number and growth in the presence or absence of nitrogen um, using a, a single main rhizobia strain. And we have now have identified new rhizobia strains that seem to influence this process or, or change this process. And there's quite a bit of variation in the types of chickpeas that you grow between desis and kabulis. Nodule grown plants generally show a reduction in shoot nitrogen redistribution and growth relative to plants receiving extra nitrogen fertilizers. And there is a significant impact on nitrogenase activity. So that nodule ability to actually deliver nitrogen is decreasing as the plants enter the reproductive phase. And we need to actually figure a way to actually return that fixation capacity up to a higher level. And plant nitrogen uptake is enhanced when plants are grown on nodule nitrogen, suggesting that they're actually starved of nitrogen, even though they're fixing nitrogen and that declines with plant age. So we have quite a bit of ongoing work in this area where we're looking at, looking at new rhizobial strains that we've identified in the field that will give chickpea an added bonus of fixing nitrogen uh, under more hot conditions as well as under more uh, stressful soil conditions. Measuring nitrogen capture from chickpea nodules. So we're also looking at how whatever nitrogen is actually captured by the nitrogenase enzyme assay and whether actually all that nitrogen is being captured by the plant or being leaked into the, into the soil uh, rhizosphere. And, and, and doing a, quite a bit of work in the molecular defining of the direct and indirect nitrogen pathways that are operating in chickpea, which is poorly understood at this stage. So I'll stop there and I think I'm under my 15 minutes. Thank you, Brent. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat box, but I would like to ask one. So, by doing those screen, is NUE more important or NAE more important? NUE versus and, what? And the, the, the nitrogen acquired efficiency is more important or nitrogen utilization efficiency is more important? I think utilization is more important, actually, what you do with it and, and to make sure that you actually use it effectively once it's in the plant, uh, whether it gets stored and, and it's not used. Um, um, 
the plants seem to be able to take up nitrogen when it's available and when they have access to it. It's actually how they actually can actually mobilize it and redistribute it across the plant um, um, to support developing seeds and, and pods is, 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 I think, becoming very important. And I, we have some new work that we've done in that area where we've identified three new ammonium channels that seem to be extremely important in delivering nitrogen to, to legume seeds. And, um, and hopefully we'll publish that very soon. So um, highlighting the importance of utilization. <laughs> Okay, so so our team has the quality work on rhizobiums. So maybe later we can connect to, to you so that different lagoons can they may have a different kinds of isobium that are more effective in nitrogen fixation. Yeah. Okay, so I guess due to the time uh, interest, we have to move on the move on to the last speaker of this session, Professor Dihani um, from um, School of Chemical and Biomedical Engineering of the University of Sydney. So uh, please get started when you're ready. Uh, I think we need to stop sharing and start again. Okay, all right, all right. okay. Okay, please. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for this uh, giving me this opportunity to have the talk. I, I think it is quite different from others, and thanks. I really learned a lot from the genetic modification of the legumes and other talks that we had. And uh, my talk is about recovery of high value compound from. Uh, Waste products. I mean, I just wanted to highlight about our research that we do in our center first. Um, I don't think I have a problem. I mean, in the Center for Advanced Food Engineering, we have three themes of research. One looking at uh, the developing technology for food processing, looking at effect of food on health, and also looking at food safety and quality. And our vision is to uh, develop knowledge to uh, design that nutritional food product with uh, having significant health benefits and minimizing food waste to improve the circular economy of food. And uh, basically one of our major research is looking at how we can use the food waste to produce high value products. And, particularly with health benefits. And I'm going to give you examples of those research that we have done during the last few years, plus uh, some of other research that we do again, looking at food for health benefit. Uh, as you know, uh, the non-communicable diseases is the major problem uh, for the death, uh, you know, about 60% of the death worldwide caused by these non-communicable diseases such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, and uh, also chronic respiratory diseases. And we wanted to see whether we can use the food as a source of, uh, you know, nutrient or method to uh, reduce the, uh, this type of disease or prevent this type of disease. Uh, one of the research that we have done is related to using the you know, when we produce in the orange juice, we have significant amount of waste produced from this process. About 50% of the orange actually goes to the landfills. And the peel will be about 30 to 40% of this waste. And but the research has shown that this waste actually contains lots of polyphenol compounds, phytochemicals, which can have lots of health benefit, particularly effect on the cancer. Uh, what we have done, we designed a technique or in, in vitro assay to assess whether this extract from the orange peel can be used for keeping the cell or cancer cell in the dormant phase. And basically, if the cell can remain in the G0 or G1 phase, which we can confirm that it has effect on the prevention of the cancer, or if it doesn't, I mean, and what we have done in here, we, this is the assay that we developed. And uh, we look at the 
this extract and see whether it has effect on the prostate cancer cell. And we demonstrate in our research that this extract from the orange peel can actually has a, a dose dependently inhibit, inhibited the cell viability. And with the in vitro assays that we developed, we demonstrate that it can actually prevent the prostate cancer cell um, growth and it can keep it in the dormant phase. Basically, this research that was in the in vitro, this in vitro study demonstrate that we can use this extract to keep the cancer cell in the dormant phase. And hopefully it can be used in future uh, for developing food that can be used for uh, prevention of cancer recurrence for people who are going through the chemotherapy. The other research that we've done is related to um, production of functional food. And we look at one of the vitamins, which we call it forgotten vitamin, uh, vitamin K7, or vitamin K in general. And it has been shown that this vitamin has significant effect on our health. It can actually uh, carry the, uh, help to carry the calcium from the artery and carry it to the bone and prevent the uh, calcification of the artery and strengthen the bone density. And it can hopefully, we can have it in our diet. It can uh, minimize the cardiovascular diseases and also can help for the pe people when they get older, uh, prevent the osteoporosis. And the major sources of the vitamin K is vegetable, green, uh, agricultural, I mean, basically vegetables, and also fermented food products, such as, for example, natto. But the fermented food, uh, you know, vitamin K, which is in the fermented food, are different form, as you can see in here. One in the vegetable has got this molecular structure. The one from the fermented food has different structure. And the MK7 and MK4, aminoquinone K7, is much more stable compared with the vitamin K1 in our body. And basically for production of the, this vitamin, one of the healthiest food that we have in the Asian food is the natto, which basically by fermentation of the soybean uh, using the bacillus subtilis bacteria, you can produce this food natto and it has very rich source of vitamin K. But unfortunately, because of the structure is not very palatable by you know, Western community. We try to use the fermentation process to produce this vitamin in high concentration. And we show that by using this uh, simple fermentation technique, we can recover vitamin K, which is a hydrophobic molecule uh, in oil, and we can produce an oil which is rich in vitamin K7. And the concentration of the vitamin K can be much higher in, in the natto and also in the cheese. It's about 500 times more than that. And we can use this, uh, method of fermentation for production of the functional food. For example, in here, we use soy milk and we optimize the condition to produce soy milk rich in vitamin K7. And we demonstrate that we can keep it stable even up to 24 weeks, even longer as well. But these are the fermented uh, method for production of the vitamin K. Uh, we also work with a company uh, produces a cherry tomato in Australia, and they had a huge problem of uh, you know, disposing the green leaves from this plant. And we identify this waste from the tom orange, you know, tomato, peel, uh, tomato production is a rich source of uh, two compounds which, are, which have health benefit, vitamin K, and also the sinusol can, can be used for production of the coenzyme Q10. Basically, if we can, we can extract this active compound from the waste of this uh, uh, agricultural product, which can have health benefit for the our society. 
Another uh, source of the vitamin K can be actually macroalgae. We have optimized the condition to produce macroalgae with high con content of the vitamin K. And now with the optimum condition that we designed, we can have vitamin K in this microalgae, which can have the same content that you can find in a bag of the spinach leaves, uh, which is again very good. But basically we wanted to reduce the cost of the vitamin K, which can de definitely in future can be used by a large community of the people and prevent this type of diseases, cardiovascular and osteoporosis. And we uh, look at how we can scale up this process. We have done also animal study and demonstrate that this product is not toxic. This mi uh, microalgae is not toxic and can be used by a human, or, of course, for animal as well. Why I call consider about animal? Because in long time ago, for uh, prevention of the homoroidal disorder in chicken, they actually use um, vitamin K, but because it was expensive, they tried to use only form of the vitamin K, which is synthetic form. And basically this synthetic form of vitamin K, menodion, uh, has, uh, is toxic to human, but it has very uh, negative effect on the bone density of the chicken, which are produced in the farm for production of the egg. And uh, other research shows that if go back to again long time ago and use vitamin K1, uh, because you know this menodion is cheaper, they use it now. But if they use vitamin K1, actually we can increase the bone density of the chicken five times. And this uh, chicken can produce more eggs for the farmer. And the vitamin K can carry into the uh, egg yolk. Basically, you can functionalize this or producing 45 uh, egg uh, with, which, with, with high concentration of the vitamin K, uh, which is again a good study. And hopefully in future, we can have low cost vitamin K, which can be used by farmer to prevent uh, you know, uh, this uh, issue with the animal welfare. In Australia and many other countries, there is a plant which produces, you know, elderberry, which is a very rich source of anthocyanin. And anthocyanin is a uh, rich, uh, is a compound which can, which has been found, has got effects on the, on the influenza and other type of flu. The problem is when they produce this uh, juice from the, this elderberry, uh, it's not the anthocyanin is not very stable and uh, they usually have to sterilize it at high temperature and there are some enzymes in the juice that degrade this anthocyanin gradually. We define a process to increase the stability of the uh, this anthocyanin and hopefully in future it can be used for uh, production of the uh, this uh, compound which can or this juice which can have lots of health benefit particularly now that we are facing with COVID-19 uh, there are many interests to see whether they can use it for improving the immunity and reducing the symptom of the flu or COVID-19. Uh, this process basically we use high pressure CO2 and we could uh, decrease the bacterial content and by addition of a small amount of the um, citric acid, we can actually prevent those enzymes which can uh, degrade the anthocyanin. Basically, we can produce more stable form of anthocyanin, which can be used for prevention of uh, or treatment of the flu symptoms. Dr. Hanin, it's uh, 12 minutes. Okay, sure. And this is about last part of our research that I wanted to share with you. We are looking at natural products and how we can use them for uh, treatment of uh, viral infection. And we, for this study, we do molecular docking and computational modeling and uh, trying to use a, a large 
data that we have from natural compound library. And from this study, we actually uh, identify compound which can have effect on the uh, prevention of the, or treatment of the herpes simplex virus infection. Uh, basically, uh, from this computational modeling, we screen and we found uh, several compounds, uh, heat compounds, which can potentially have effect. Then we have done in vitro studies. Uh, and by conducting this in vitro study, we confirmed that this compound has got uh, effect on the herpes simplex virus infection and can be used hopefully in future in combination with other compounds for treatment of a happy simple virus uh, infection. And I would like to acknowledge our team and supporter for this, this research by industry and also Australian Research Council. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let's see whether there's any questions from the audience. Oh, then I asked a, a, a question, right? So, Ferment, fermentation seems to be very powerful to uh, produce more of the, those uh, special nutrients. So in your experience, how is, <laughs> so because I work on soybean, right? So how is fermented soybean coming into the picture of like, producing more vitamin K or other things? Yes, they already actually use that, as I mentioned to you in, China, in, uh, in Japan. They use soybean and they put it in the middle of the rice uh, not hope, not hope, right? That's right, not hope, yes. They already do that. And we did also solid fermentation of the soy and we can produce this vitamin uh, rich source of, you know. But as I said, because they're producing some slimy structure, it's not very palatable, but Japanese love it. <laughs> and you can <laughs> add some soy sauce and use that, yes. Yeah, it's, it's fastidious. <laughs> but so, the concentration is not as required on a daily dose, a daily requirement, but still very good rich uh, source of vitamin and cheese is another source of vitamin K7, but the concentration is low. That's why we are looking at some other source of production of vitamin K to decrease the cost. Yes. So last question probably from Butcher Chat Wong. So what's the biggest hurdle to scale up the production of vitamin K? Uh, the, the hurdle, I mean, we are looking for company can, you know, we are looking for companies to commercialize it. Uh, one of the company that we collaborate considered to do that, but they are doing some market on, um, analysis to see how they can do it in the future. Yes, we are collaborating with the company to commercialize it, yes. Great. Well, so uh, thank you very much. So due to the time interest, we have to stop here and probably we need to skip this break. <laughs> so I will pass the stage directly to Dr. Sonia Liu. So Sonia, please uh, start uh, to be the moderator. Thanks, Professor Lam. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Sonia Liu from University of Sydney. I am actually an animal scientist by training. I work closely with the poultry industry to provide high quality chicken meat and egg. So I'm very excited about previous presentation about potential applications and collaborations in poultry production. So my role here is as a person who is very passionate about global food security to support my colleagues from global uh, Office of Global Engagement to develop workshops like today. It is my great honor today to chair the next session. Our first speaker uh, for this session is Professor Amos Tai from Chinese University of Hong Kong, and he will be talking to us today about implications for the carbon, nitrogen, water cycles, and environmental health co-benefits. So let's welcome Professor Tai. Right, thank you very much, Sonia. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. So let me share my screen. And if you cannot hear me, please let me know. Uh, yep, so I'll go right into it. Uh, hold on. 
Okay, great. Yep, so I am Amos Tai. I'm from, uh, I'm an atmospheric scientist by training. So it would be, uh, I have a kind of like a different expertise than the previous speakers, uh, but I'm very concerned with the issues with uh, sustainable food. So uh, I'm not, I have very limited time. So I'm just here, it's like just a snapshot about my research. Uh, basically, we look a lot at uh, biosphere atmosphere interactions and their relevance to air pollution and climate change. So uh, about half of my work is actually about forestry, uh, looking at how forests interact with uh, the atmosphere and how they can serve as carbon sink as well as a sink for air pollutants. Uh, but for the purpose of this uh, today, uh, I will focus more on uh, another half of my work, which is on how we can use sustainable food production and maybe change our consumption patterns in order to, to help mitigate climate change and air pollution. Uh, so this would be the focus of my, uh, of my uh, talk today. All right, but if you're in, any one of you interested in uh, forestry issues related to climate change, uh, I will be very happy to discuss afterward as well. But today I'll focus more on agricultural part of my work. Uh, very important to lay out, uh, like lay this out. Uh, most of my methodology would be numerical modeling and statistical analysis of the Earth system. So when I say models, uh, I mean something maybe rather different from what a biologist would say uh, when they refer to models. So when I say model, basically we mean mathematical models. Uh, we use uh, mathematical equations to represent all of these natural processes happening in the atmosphere, the environment, the land surface. Uh, chemical, physical, and biological processes, we try to code them into uh, computer uh, models and then run them in supercomputers. So uh, the kind of models that we typically work with include uh, climate models that can simulate climate dynamically, uh, air quality models, I work a lot with this, and also land surface and agricultural models, which are mostly uh, process-based, you know, simulating photosynthesis, simulating uh, hydrological processes, and things like that. So later when I discuss my result, uh, you uh, please understand that most of my results are from an integration of uh, statistical analysis of real world data uh, and integrated with a numerical modeling of all of these uh, processes. So I'm sure uh, a lot of us here are familiar with the impacts of human uh, beings, especially agricultural production on the environment. So here I'm showing you the nitrogen fluxes from the land surface to the atmosphere and also from the atmosphere back to the land surface. And the, the red number, the black numbers are the uh, total fluxes, all right? And the red numbers are the uh, anthropogenic fluxes, basically the human contribution to these fluxes. You can really see that human contribution is dominant in the total contribution or the total fluxes of uh, reactive nitrogen from the land surface to the atmosphere, right? And of which uh, agricultural production is the dominant part. So by producing food, we are adding tremendous amount of nitrogen to the atmosphere uh, through the emission of things like uh, ammonia, uh, uh, nitrogen oxides and uh, dinitrogen oxide as well. So all of these would lead to various problems, for instance, N2O is a very potent greenhouse gas and thus agriculture is one of the major contributors to climate change. Uh, the NOx or nitrogen oxides, they are uh, actually a precursor for uh, tropospheric ozone, which is a very important air pollutant that harm both crops and uh, human health. So this is a very big contributor to air pollution. And also uh, the NOx from uh, fossil fuel combustion and agriculture, they can be oxidized in the atmosphere forming nitric acid, all right? And nitric acid can also react with uh, ammonia from uh, agriculture, mostly from fertilizer use and also animal waste in animal husbandry. So they can react to form fine particulate matter, PM2.5, which is of course one of the biggest uh, sources of air pollutants in the whole world. A major issue in many agricultural regions, uh, including China, uh, India, uh, Latin America, and so on and so forth, all right? So as you can see, by emitting a lot of nitrogen, disturbing the nitrogen cycle, agricultural production, uh, play a significant role contributing to the issue of climate change and air pollution. So we then ask questions like, can we actually improve the way we grow food in order to reduce pollution and climate change, 
All right. So one of the uh, methods that we have thought of uh, at OFJ together with Hongming is maybe intercropping. Intercropping with soybean, as most of you know, soybean is a nitrogen fixer. So if we intercrop, grow crops to get, grow, grow other kind of crops together with soybean, then soybean being a nitrogen fixer may perhaps uh, provide more uh, nitrogen or stimulate uh, the nitrogen uh, production in the in, in the soil and thus reducing the need to use fertilizer. So we thought, okay, so if, and this has been shown in uh, field studies, right? So our, through collaboration, uh, our collaborators in the field sites actually have shown us that, well, these uh, by intercropping actually reduce fertilizer use and also reduce uh, the emission of nitrogen from the, uh, from the soil, right? So then we think, okay, so if intercropping can reduce in uh, uh, ammonia uh, emission, uh, as, at least in the field studies, can we estimate how big of an impact it can be on the whole, uh, for instance, on, in the whole China, if we switch all agricultural productions to intercropping, right? So most of the agricultural production right now is, a lot of it is monoculture. But if we use intercropping instead of monoculture, on a wide, large scale over all of China, what would be the environmental impacts? So through numerical models, we can simulate it. We can try to address this issue. What we found is that uh, if we implement intercropping across all of China, right, ammonia reduction can actually be reduced by up to 50%, which is a big reduction, okay? And it can then reduce the amount of particulate matter, air pollution by uh, this much by more than uh, one microgram per meter cube, okay? And uh, yeah, so these are just the modeling uh, tools that we use, which I'm sure uh, you may not be too interested in. The, the results are more what is important. So we show that uh, using modeling and combined with field data, we show that intercropping, if we implement it countrywide, can have the potential to reduce air pollution, okay? In addition to securing food production. We continue to do a cost benefit analysis and found that uh, by intercropping, we can have additional yield because you're growing soybean alongside the maize or wheat. You can save fertilizer, okay? There is some additional labor cost because intercropping is harder to implement than uh, monoculture. There is some additional labor cost, but there is a tremendous amount of saved health cost associated with air pollution. So this is the first time really we have able to show that, well, uh, by intercropping, by, by implementing intercropping, we can indeed save people's health uh, by reducing air pollution, okay? And this indirect health benefit can be quite substantial, okay? Compared relative to uh, the total gain from the additional yield of soybean. So we found that the net uh, benefit can be about this much per year. So we show that intercropping with soybean can maintain yield while reducing the active nitrogen emissions, particulate matter pollution, and thus the related premature deaths and health costs. So sustainable farming methods in food production can really uh, provide, can really try uh, be a gateway to enhance both food security and environmental health. So in another study, we think about, okay, so we have- we have addressed, we have tried to address the production side or the supply side. What about the demand side, right? Because demand and supply goes together, right? If we don't demand the food, then they don't have to grow it. So can we also address how people eat in order to reduce nitrogen emission from agriculture? So we have looked at, particularly at China, okay? So China has grown tremendously over the past uh, 50 years and our meat consumption has increased fivefold just within uh, 30 years, okay? So what we, what we thought, hypothesized is that, well, meat consumption is one of the major uh, emission source of uh, nitrogen, okay? So through fertilizer use to grow the feed and also animal waste from animal husbandry, they are really important sources of uh, nitrogen in Chinese agriculture. So when Chinese people have been turning more and more toward being a you know, meat eater, okay? Of course, there would be some direct health benefit, uh, health impacts like obesity or cardiovascular diseases, but perhaps there can also be indirect health impacts by enhancing ammonia emission and thus PM 
which then can hurt respiratory and cardiovascular uh, systems of the Chinese population. This is our hypothesis, but nobody has really proved it. So through, again, integration of real-world data and numerical modeling, we were able to do numerical experiments to found that, well, over the past 30 years, the higher meat consumption have actually led to worsening meat, uh, sorry, worsening PM 2.5 pollution. Dietary changes in China, mainly through higher meat consumption, have caused ammonia emission to increase by more than 60%. And annual mean PM 2.5 to rise more than 10 micrograms per meter cube, which is about 20% of the total increase in PM 2.5 from all sources over this region. Which basically it's a tie means that, 10 minutes. All right. Which basically means that um, well, meat rising meat consumption is one of the major contributors to the worsening air pollution problem in China over the past 30 years. Okay. So we want to understand, well, if that's the case, can we revert the trend, okay? So we also found that, oh yeah, by the way, so this is, uh, uh, we also calculate the uh, premature mortality. Uh, I'm going, not going to talk about this point. We want to see whether reversing the trend by switching from a meat heavy diet as of now to a more um, plant-based diet, okay? Following the Chinese uh, dietary guideline, okay? If we, if the whole Chinese population uh, switch to a, or reduce meat consumption, switch to a more uh, plant-based diet, what would happen? So we use our model and do the simulation. And we found that if we do that, okay, on a whole population level, ammonia emission can be reduced by 20%, uh, PM 2.5 reduced by this much, and the number of deaths related to PM 2.5 can be reduced by this much per year. So this is the first uh, work really to show that sustainable farming methods uh, for production and also for uh, dietary choices for consumption can be important strategies to actually mitigate air pollution in China and environmental impacts of agriculture. And of course, that would have a uh, co-benefit for climate change as well, because meat consumption is also one of the biggest sources of um, uh, uh, greenhouse gases in, uh, in, in the, across the world, all right? So this work has been published uh, last year in Nature Food. So to conclude, we found that sustainable farming methods, okay, like intercropping with soybean. Uh, we also work on drip irrigation right now. Uh, they can really have potential to secure both food production and reduce air pollution and related health costs in China. And at the same time, not just the supply side, even from the demand side, reversing current dietary trends, adopting more meat, a more plant-based diet, can also have the production uh, potential to reduce air pollution and related health costs. So we can see that uh, the e issues with health, uh, air pollution related health costs, uh, the issue of food security, and also the issue of climate change, they're closely linked together and addressing agricultural methods and agricultural demand would be very important to make sure that we can have enhanced food security and environmental health simultaneously in the future. All right. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I think this is a good time for questions and answers. Thank you. Is there any questions? I can't see anything, any question coming through. Um, since we are actually 10 minutes behind the schedule, so uh, I will not ask any question from myself. So thanks very much for your presentation, Professor Tai. And we will move on to the next speaker today. And that's associate, Pro oh, sorry, it's Professor um, Thomas Bishop, my colleague from Sydney Informatics Hub. And he will be talking to us today about digital agriculture for improved management of landscapes. So that's welcome, Professor Bishop. Thank you, Sonia. Is, I've, I'm sharing the slideshow. It's, it's good. Okay. Thanks for that introduction, Sonia. And thank you, Amos, for that talk. Sort of set the scene quite well. So um, there's a lot of stickers on this talk. Um, there's people collaborators and funding bodies. So I want to acknowledge the, those people as well. And I suppose what this talk is about is just focusing on modeling and managing carbon and water in agricultural landscapes. And Amos gave a nice introduction about one, one of the modeling communities or the modeling communities out there. But I suppose what I want to talk about is how digital agriculture data can bridge that gap to get better data to inform those models. Um, and then I suppose end on 
two opportunities for this in that commodity mapping in sort of large national scale, regional scale uses of digital agriculture data, but then down to soil water now casting, which is an example of, you know, what a grower could use, digital agriculture data they could use on their farm to improve management decisions on their farm. Okay, so this, they, both of them are linked to food security and all those other things. So, um, you know, if you just think about agriculture in simplistic terms, it is just largely about managing carbon and water and landscapes. Easy, job done. So that's essentially, you know, if you think we use the water, whether it's stored in soil, the water that comes from rain or the water we apply with irrigation, we use that to create biomass, which is effectively carbon. And so if we have a good idea of the amount of water we have and that constrains how much biomass we can use. So in a dry land cropping situation, if we know the seasonal water availability, we can set some potential yield targets. And then we can start to match inputs such as fertilizer to our yield targets, to our seasonal yield targets. So what that means is rather than, you know, Brent talked about earlier about excess or incorrect fertilizer use. Amos just talked about excessive fertilizer or use of fertilizer. Nitrogen fertilizer has many deleterious impacts. So the idea here is that we can match our fertilizer rates to our actual potential yield based on water availability. We're, we're moving in the right direction in terms of a lot of the SDGs. And then what even next will it's going to touch on soil and resilience. You know, one indicator of some resilience of a landscape is the amount of carbon in the soil. So that relates to another SDG. So that that's carbon and water in agricultural landscapes. So um, in terms of the two, there's two modeling communities, which um, Amos touched upon. So there's the, the land surface modelers, that's one tribe. And, you know, um, I suppose, when, when you're applying these models to agricultural landscapes, you do have to make some assumptions about management. So it's very good for, you know, regional applications, national applications, such as Amos showed, but getting down to the nitty gritty about onto a farm, it's less useful, largely due to many of the assumptions we have to make about management. So, um, you know, the base, quite often we have simple land use classes. We have dry land cropping, irrigated cropping, pasture, forest, the simple land uses. And then we have to make some assumptions about what crops are growing within that cropping land use class, for example, and the type of management that people use. So, and then there's the issue of spatial scale. You know, what's the resolution these models at? So the, these models run out. So one to five kilometers could be typical. And then some of the models have, due to the, the paucity of soil data, they have simple representations of soil. So soil is a beautiful thing many different colors you can see in that profile, they might represent all those different colors, all those different horizons, all that vertical variation by one or two layers. So they, they you know, that they, they have their place, but there, you know, um, there are some problems. When you apply it to dynamic agricultural landscapes with different crops, different rotations. Now, then we have the crop modeling tribe. So these people, the agricultural scientists, they generally focusing on one site at a time. And they, 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 these, these models such as APSIM, DSAT, well, that's misspelled there, but what they rely on is a lot of soil information. You have to know many soil properties to run these models. You have to know detailed management information. So they struggle with generalizing to landscapes. So I suppose somewhere in the middle is, is the right approach. And so there are flaws in these individual approaches. If I suppose if you want to apply them, say, across the farm, okay, they each, they have the, they're very useful in their own right, but I suppose what I'm focusing here upon is across a paddock or a farm, how can we apply these models? And then, so what we have also is digital agriculture. So basically I'm focusing on precision agriculture in terms of dry land cropping or cropping in general. Okay, so the idea here is it began with a yield map. So on the, you know, this is a yield map from 1997. We have wheat yield across a paddock in, Eastern Australia, um, you can see there's a lot of variability in yield. So the yellow patch is two tons a hectare, the blue patches have five tons a hectare. So what that means is there's this big difference in yield production. So the idea is, can we match our inputs to where we manage this field to that the different yield potential? Okay. And so what we do is we interrogate this yield map with other data. So back in 1997, this Landsat image is from my PhD, cost $2,000 and it was one image. To, to fabricate a PhD around. So it was very hard to collect data. So that's what digital ag agriculture was. It was focusing on one field at a time and trying to understand what is happening. So, so what it's become is that hard one $2,000 image 
that Landsat, that's a satellite platform, we now have the entire record for free. And there's other platforms, better platforms that are free as well that have come around. So there's this vast quantity of free data on the bottom, which we can apply to anywhere pretty much in the world to characterize the crop growing environments. So these types of things can help us inform our modeling. But with digital agriculture, you know, just using wheat cropping as an example, grain cropping as an example, 40% of growers in Australia have a yield monitor. So what we have in terms of modeling and managing carbon and water fluxes in the landscape, we have, imagine 40% of the grain growing region of Australia, each year we're measuring biomass removal or carbon outputs from that landscape. So you get the feeling that this is, if this is a data stream we can use to better model and manage carbon and water in our landscapes. So growers also collect more soil data to characterize the soil, so there's better soil information. And intriguingly, they collect operational data. So what I mean is every time a machine goes across the paddock, there's, you know, the sowing date, the harvest date, the tillage date, there's all this operational data that's available. And that's, I suppose, something that the, this model, the modern communities need to run their models. So I suppose that's, I suppose where that's the connection between the modeling carbon and water in agricultural landscapes and digital agriculture. So just to use, just use an example of two immediate applications. Okay, so what I'm gonna focus on is the use of the yield monitor data, not to model yield, which we do do, but actually to, um, in this case here, we just have two example corporate farms. So they have, they have a number of farms across Australia. It's an amazing amount of paddock years. So we have all this yield monitor data. So it's a, it's a vast amount of area from 2013. So this is one example of a corporate farm, but the PCT, this is probably one, it's probably 5% of the yield data they hold for Australia, perhaps, and then they hold yield data around the world. So it gives you an idea of this opportunity. So I'm not gonna talk about yield, but what I wanna talk about is using this data to map commodities. So the idea is during a season, you know, now we're now cotton in Australia is being harvested. About three months ago, we have an approach where we could have predicted the area of cotton that was planted. So you can imagine with food security, supply chain logistics, you could use that type of information to know what crops are being grown where, using that um, yield data as a training data, you know, where the crops are grown. Um, and also you could use that to inform the land surface models or, you know, those broad land surface models, the type of crop that is grown. So this the difference here is we're using the shape. This is this shows the greenness, the NDVI through a cotton season. And the idea is we use the shape of that through the season to work out the different what different crops are grown where. So you know you can get maps, you know, Eastern Australia relatively easily with cloud computing. Um, yeah, you know, during the season, and as the season progresses, you get better predictions. Okay, so it's very important. So and that's commodity mapping. So rather than having these static land, land use maps, just saying irrigated crops, and that's all you know. You just know that's generally irrigated crops. You don't know if they've got an irrigated crop growing. Here we know what crops are growing where. And we know this, you know, there's about one week latency with the remote sensing, you know, to, to spin up the model and apply it across Eastern Australia. So, um, so another opportunity, so that was more about regional applications. You know, you can imagine supply chain logistics, knowing how much food is going to be grown across the country. The other application is soil water. So here I'm going to zero down to a farm. And in terms of, so digital agriculture data streams available, this in Australia, these are publicly available soil moisture probe networks. So you have a point estimate of soil water down to about a meter. There's multiple probes at each location. And this, these have gone down in price remarkably. So, and also they're connected, you know, so you can look at the data online, you get the data. So that's one data store. So more and more growers are installing, installing these soil moisture probes. So they can use to calibrate, validate these um, carbon and water models. And so that's, that's something, but also there's most of the folk, well, I was talking with the cotton about optical remote sensing. This is actually a product um, from microwave remote sensing. Um, and basically with that, you can get a surface estimate of soil water, the top five centimeters across the landscape, in, the, in this case, in this platform, to one kilometer spatial resolution. The repeat is 12 to 24 days. So 24 days in Australia. So you get this you get this wall-to-wall -wall coverage of soil water information, which then could be used fed into soil water models. 
And so you have a choice here. Five centimeters. So yeah. Five centimeter depth here, and then you have, or you have soil moisture probes, and that can inf inform water balance modeling across the landscape. So, this is a paper we published um, a while ago, and we're currently working on this work more. And the idea here is, you can run the water balance model equation with different spatial inputs. It's modular in that you can slot in local farmer data. You can do this nationally in Australia based on this freely available data. Much of this data is available around the world. In terms of soil, there's an equivalent to the Soil Landscape Group of Australia to get the bucket size. So it could be applied, you know, anywhere in the world. And, you know, you could potentially, what we're working on is assimilating these types of observations, using this, this, these observations to locally calibrate the model on farms. But we are also trying to operationalize it over a large area. So in Australia, we have the Murray-Darling Basin, you can see the green area there. It's 40% um, of Australia's agricultural production. And we just wanted to see the research compute costs to spin this up on our national computing infrastructure. And, you know, to spin up a 20 year model at 500 spatial, 500 meters spatial resolution was actually very cheap, $150. So we actually, we only did it at 500 because we were worried about the computational cost. So this is a little test case. And you can see, you know, we have this historical record of soil water and we, and, it's part of a current project on soil water now casting, um, where, you know, basically with the latency of the remote sensing, so the time from like being an overpass to being processed could be 16 days. So we can predict soil water how it was 16 days ago. Um, yeah, currently, all right. So pretty much anywhere in Australia. And we, so we're working further on making this higher spatial resolution and making it more real time. So this is a historical spin up of the model. So you can imagine what you can do with soil water observations for a particular farm, but also for planning across, considering food security across a large region, get an idea of simple measures of the potential productivity of a season. So um, in summary, I suppose, I think there's a lot of opportunities in earth observation and on-farm on sensing to integrate these into better modeling of agricultural landscapes. I was really focused on carbon and water. So I just showed one example of a sector-wide approach, commodity mapping has some usefulness for food security, down to a farm-specific approach, soil water, which also could be scaled over a large region. And future work is um, just, yeah, we, we've tried to do commodity mapping of other winter crops, wheat, barley, et cetera, but trying to do earth observation, sensing of management. So using that, you know, can we know the sowing date, the tillage date, the harvest dates? Well, you know, the, the amount of tillage impacts on the soil resilience, the soil structure, the soil carbon. Those, this type of information could be fed into models. Um, the training data is farm machinery. And um, I suppose in terms of collaborations, you know, um, trying to use any of these input, uh, products, I suppose, as inputs into land surface models would be great. And also just applying these approaches, you know, to different countries around the world is, I suppose, possible future collaboration. So thank you very much. And that is it. Thank you, Professor Bishop. I can't see any question coming through the chat. So um, and our speakers, I encourage you to answer the questions if it come through the chat during other people's presentation. I think that has already been done by Professor Tai. So thank you. All right. Um, thanks. Um, thanks, Tom. And we will move on. Yep. So our next speaker for this session is Associate Professor Jirong Hui from Chinese University of Hong Kong. And he is an evolutionary biologist and zoologist by training. And he will be talking to us today about soil biology, sorry, soil biodiversity. Let's welcome Professor Hui. Right, uh, thank you, Sonia. Uh, first of all, I mean, I thank uh, the organizer for giving me the opportunity to speak over here. I mean, I, I enjoy the workshop very much. So, um, well, I, I said my talk is slightly different to many of the others. I mean, as you can see, I mean, I work on um, um, fauna. I work on animals, of course. I also work with uh, animal and plants interaction and also plants with my collaborators. But today I want to sh show you something that we have an expertise in and a niche in the world, I mean, to which we are studying the soil biodiversity or macrofauna. So whenever people think about soil macrofauna, immediately we come into earthworms. I mean, 
Both films are, of course, very important, but there has been lots of other biodiversity we have really, really missed the ecological roles. I mean, for example, nutrients recycling, etc. And today I'm going to talk about them. So, and typically I want to focus my talk on arthropods. Okay. So arthropods are the are the most successful group of animals in the world. Um, here I show you three major groups of animals that we'll be able to find in, in agricultural farmland. First of all, are insects, no matter they are beneficial ones or their pests which I, I work on, but I'm not going to talk about them today. The arachnids, like the spiders or scorpions, I mean, they are, of course, I mean, uh, dangerous to farmers in the field, etc., which I also won't talk about today. Today, in the limited amount of time, I will focus my talk on the middle one, the mural pose, and typically the centipedes and millipedes. As many of us know that they are very important nutrients recycler, I mean, uh, from well, the, the millipedes are the, are the one to which they will uh, recycle leaf litters, et cetera, back into the soil and build up the soil nutrients. However, the action roles are not very well known. Centipedes are the other one that will be uh, are doing the uh, other organic matters. Nevertheless, poorly, poorly known, well, due to historical reasons, because when, when people go into agriculture, when they think about microfauna, immediately go into earthworms. But many of the biology is the same, I mean, for, for mural pores, I mean, that are poorly pulling long in arthropods. So today I'm going to, going to talk about genomics or from the genomic perspective. So, well, this is pretty much what I included in the arthropods, like insects, crustaceans, cholesterols, like the uh, arachnids, and also the mural pores. If you take a look into the mural pores, comparing to the rest of the other uh, arthropod genomes, you only have three. I mean, uh, of course, I mean, I was involved in the first uh, genome and also published the other two. So they are very, very few. I mean, that are actually included in this group of animals. So two years ago, I mean, uh, we, we published uh, the first two millipid genomes in the world. I mean, uh, we try to understand what could be the unique biology that we'll be able to get from them. Because of the limited amount of time, I'm not going to go through everything. Well, I just bring up one key, I mean, which I think potentially will be useful, I mean, for, for different applications. For example, the chemical defense in millipedes, that is called the otaxin gland. So when the millipedes are being attacked, they will either curl together, release the chemicals, okay? So people know that they're actually the hydrogen cyanide. However, chemists have been working for that for numerous years, I mean, through our century, but still the pathway are poorly known. But now because we have a genome, we identify the first biosynthetic pathway of how this uh, chemical pathway can be, can be synthesized. This is just uh, one example of when we have the genomes of this uh, poorly understood uh, animals, what can we do? So, I mean, two years ago, and then once we have uh, the first two millipede genomes, we then ask the questions, can we actually know more about the soil biodiversity? So, uh, well, I mean, instead of using a traditional approach, we go to the field and take them by themselves, by ourselves. What we have done is that we, we have asked the secondary school students and also the NGOs, we, we try to do a soil biodiversity citizen science in Hong Kong. Well, people will go out to the field and try to take them out, I mean, uh, every month. And then uh, in, in a year time, we actually discovered uh, 151 soil microfauna including 24 millipede species. And uh, of course, many of them are the new, newly described species. I mean, uh, this is uh, uh, still in the revision for this paper. So what we know, I mean, well, we, we have poorly understood uh, soil biodiversity. So what can we do next? So this is a paper that will be coming out in uh, one or two weeks, okay? So, um, so I, I only go back to the mural pose, I mean, including the millipedes and centipedes. So um, this time I have uh, tried to uh, sequence the genomes from different groups of millipedes and centipedes that were able to, to find in uh, Hong Kong or Asia, okay? So uh, well, we, we try to analyze the different characteristics that actually allow the centipedes and millipedes to diversify to the different natural environment. So uh, that, that paper is coming out, uh, as I've said, in one or two weeks. 
So uh, we, we have done many different types of millipedes entities involved in growth uh, stage, et cetera. So one example that I want to share with you, which is also an expertise in my lab, is that we study uh, hormones. One of the hormones we study are juvenile hormones. I mean, juvenile hormones are very important um, targets for people making insecticides. Because for example, juvenile hormone and in insects, they usually grow very high in level and then they will drop dramatically during the larvae to be before they do into a metamorphosis, for example. Similarly, in crustaceans, they do similar thing. So uh, many insecticides have been using uh, juvenile hormone as targets to manipulate the growth uh, such that the insects won't grow. Or in the other way, if you want to promote insect production, you want to manipulate the other way. Uh, a few years ago, I mean, we republished, I mean, as I said, at that time, I was only involved in this uh, centipede genome consortium. So we found that this kind of uh, sesquiterpenoids uh, hormones are not really unique in insects, but actually also in other pores. Uh, also two years ago, we found that actually more uh, widespread also in jellyfish. So this time we found these hormones are actually also regulating in the centipedes and millipedes, but they are in different ways. So uh, this can be potentially a very good target if we want to manipulate the numbers. So, uh, well, I mean, now we include, I mean, uh, to, to the genomes only into nine. So taking a look into the mirror course throughout the world, we have thousands. I mean, just uh, take a quick look in Australia, there are 2,000, 3,000, and we have no idea about them. I mean, so, I mean, uh, we, we on our side, I mean, uh, we are very lucky to be supported by the Hong Kong Research Grand Council Collaborative Research Fund. We have acquired the uh, sequencer, which will allow us to uh, carry out genome sequencing. And this is a uh, 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 work that is uh, led by the CHK. So how about serving back into this workshop that we think into a bigger goal that we can try to achieve by our two sides together? I, I think of about four. First of all, can we learn more about the different life forms on land, both in Hong Kong and Australia? I mean, because we have many indigenous species, uh, endemic species, I think there must, there must be laws from them that we'll be able to know. How about the climate change effect on them? How can they actually contribute to the nutrient cycle? As I've said, it's poorly, poorly known for different other reports, especially the mural reports. And how can we actually achieve zero hunger via agricultural applications. And typically I want to talk about when people use about uh, earthworms, they will think about compost. People are now exploring millipedes into different kinds of compost. So can we, how are the different farmland? For example, when you have this crop, what are the different um, arthropods that will be useful? A poorly, poorly investigator. I'm a biologist. I can do something, but there are things that outside my discipline. And I really hope I'll be able to find someone to work together in a very long term to solve these questions together. Last but not least, I would also like to point out to you that our two universities, we are both on APRU network and your university and our university is the co-lead in this uh, APRU Biodiversity and Pacific Ocean. Typically, we are gathering different universities across the Pacific Ocean and we are trying to work on the biodiversity together. And from your side is, I think it's a Nathan Lowe and also a Kefi, Kefi Beloff, I mean, your, your pro VC. I, on our side is myself and, uh, and uh, Alan Chen, our provost. So we hope that we can group something together in order to try to solve these uh, important questions together. With that, I need to thank uh, my collaborators, people in my lab, as well as my funding agencies. So I hope you'll be interested and get convinced that they are very important and of course, I mean, it's not necessary if you think on the other hand that my expertise will be able to contribute to your side. I'm also very happy too. So I hope to look forward to any uh, future and long-term collaborations. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Huai. I think there were a few discussions in the chat, but I'm just screwing back to see whether there's any question related to you. Right. Uh, they, they, they are super long, I can see. <laughs> no, right. sorry, that, that was my comment. Please right. don't let my comment take the, take the ah. stage. Oh, okay, um, right. So there yeah. may be in no order, erosion, tension, uh, water, so, no, uh, 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 okay. So um, 
Uh, yeah. David, I'll try to, I mean, is that address for me or for, for Amos or for Thomas? Um, uh, uh, Thomas, so is I that think, for me? Thomas, I your question. Oh, no, I Thomas think is it's answering, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, okay. Professor Bishop was answering for his questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. All right. Um, maybe people need to spend a little bit more time to digest it and uh, just keep eye on the chat and then maybe there will be more questions coming through. Thanks yeah. very much for your presentation, Professor Hui. Right. And let's move on to our um, next speaker, which is the final speaker for this session, is Professor Budiman Minesni. Uh, I hope I pronounced that correct. So um, Professor Minesni will talk to us about uh, soil carbon in balancing the multifunctionality of soils. And uh, Professor Minesni is also the theme lead for soil carbon and water at the Sydney Institute of Agriculture. So let's welcome Professor uh, Minesni. Thanks, Sonia. Thanks for the introduction. So I'm actually the past uh, the team leader. So the current team leader is uh, Federico Maggi. Uh, so today I'll, I'll talk about soil carbon. So thanks uh, to Amos, uh, Tom Bishop and uh, Jerome for the introduction. So this is continuing on the team about soil. So I'm a soil scientist and we are a group of soil scientists uh, at the University of Sydney that we work on soil. So our work spans mostly on the uh, fundamental research to applied research to understand how soil uh, works in functioning, in functioning so that most of the time we talk about soil as a biomass production to produce food. But as Amos uh, pointed out, it's also a source of biodiversity. Uh, sorry, uh, Jerome has pointed out it's a source of biodiversity as well, either macrofauna or microfauna. But there are other functions of soil, like a climate regulations to do with uh, soil carbon and climate change, water cycling and nutrient cycling. There are others one, but we'll focus on this five and. Usually what we did is that uh, we focus on biomass production and by focusing on biomass production, sometimes we uh, trade off by losing the other functions, for example, biodiversity, habitat or nutrient cycling and so on. So to understand how the works together as a soil, as a multifunctional working all together. So we need to understand the, 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 the the things that drive the soil and one of the, the key components we call the fuel of the soil is the soil organic carbon or SOC what we point out uh, uh, in the middle of this picture. So why SOC soil organic carbon it's a dynamics in the soil it's a complexity of the soil which depends on the plant inputs and uh, interacts with the soil biota, the, the either the macrofauna or the microfauna. And by working together, it can help in terms of uh, water regulation, in terms of infiltration and controlling greenhouse gases, the climate regulations and biodiversity as a habitat to different types of uh, micro from microorganism or microorganism and also for biomass production. So what we are doing is that we want to study the soil as a component, as a system or the component of an ecosystem. So by starting from the first, uh, the, from the micro, micro scale to see the fundamental interactions, how the organic matter, microbes and soil interact and how this is upscale to the plant and to the community, plant community in a farm or in a cropland and also to the region. And the first example also that I can show you that is the fundamental work that we are looking. We are looking at how the soil uh, forms uh, interact between the, the mineral phases and the organic matter phases through the minerals and the cells and organic matter, matter interactions. So we start from the fundamentals that uh, if the soil that is made up of a pure clay materials, what would happen if we introduce some organic matter? So uh, on, the, on the conceptually that people has, uh, has uh, produced some conceptual diagram, conceptual idea that if you introduce the soil uh, mineral to uh, organic matter, it will form uh, these aggregates and within these aggregates the carbon will be protected. So we are trying to look from the fundamentals of what happening if we have a pure system 
that without the interference of the uh, binding agents of the or the cations or the clay minerals, what would happen? So uh, we we take the soil, the pure mineral, and then add added glucose and cellulose to the system, and then we add microbes to the system, and then we observe what's happening. We use a CT scan to look into the structure of the soil, uh, to, to, to look at the mineral parts and take away the mineral parts to get a pores part and then look at the pore networks. And by looking at that, we can understand more about what's the fundamentals of uh, interactions between the soil organic matter and microbial interaction. So what do we, did we found? So we found that the, the modification of the structure of the pore size, the pore porosity that's within the micrometers porosity that within the soil, it depends on the interaction between the types of organic matter and the types of microbes and a type of uh, microbial activities. So that is without microbial activities or low with microbial activities will not produce a unique pore size distribution that is required for the for the for the microbes to live and that is able to store more water uh, and uh, and trans tra transport air. So this is some of the fundamentals that we are trying to work to understand that how structure is soil aggregate is created because. That is the fundamental of the organic matter that is going to be stored in the soil. And we have to balance the amount of organic matter that is available to the microbes and the one that can be stored in the soil so that it can be conserved for climate change mitigation because of the soil carbon. So uh, we understand that the micro scale, we can do measurement of what we call as a different types of carbon in the soil. Now we want to upscale it through the whole of Australia. So working with colleagues at the CSIRO and the, the a TURN project, an Australian project, uh, we collected samples, these are soil samples, uh, which has been characterized for the type of what we call as different types of carbons. So uh, we can do this and uh, each of these points are measurements of different types of uh, uh, sorry, uh, the carbon in the soil, and we can upscale it with what we call the uh, digital soil mappings. We're going to make a predictive modeling with the uh, machine learnings, and we can predict at a high resolution, high resolution that for the whole continent of Australia, every 30 meter will have an estimate of how much carbon is in the soil from the surface up to down to two meters. And further on, we want to not just estimate the total carbon in the soil, but the types of carbon in the soil, which is which uh, we can roughly divide it into three types. One is the particulate organic matter, the organic matter that is uh, part of the res residue of the plant that has not been decomposed. Uh, and it's, it's uh, still pieces of decaying plants and animals, which has a shorter life, life form, but this is, uh, particulate organic matter is important as a source of food for uh, either macrofauna or microbial communities. And then there's a, what we call as mineral associated organic matter, uh, organic matter which is bound to the minerals of the soil. And if it's bound in the minerals of the soil, that means that it is stays longer in the soil. And in terms of climate change mitigation, this is the, the carbon that we want the soil to stay longer in the soil so it's not going to be released back into the atmosphere so we can lock that carbon in the soil. And then in Australia, because of fires and other activities, we have also uh, what we call as char or resistant organic carbon, which will persist a long time in the soil. So by using machine learning uh, techniques uh, based on observations that we have uh, uh, across Australia, we can now see that the this distribution of different types of carbon, not just a total carbon, but how much of it is due to particulate organic matter, particulate, that means the one that are available for the microbes to, to live on, to consume, and the, how much of it is are just char materials. The char materials are the one it's a blue color, and then the particulate are the ones that are green, greener in color, and then the, the mineral associated in the redder color. That means that they are only in the, in the soil and uh, not available for, for the microbes to consume. But 
having this kind of information and balance about what is a particulate, how much particulate compared to the mineral associate allow us to run simulation modeling such as what uh, Amos have uh, sh shown uh, previously to work out uh, potential of carbon sequestration and uh, what, what which area are in terms of which areas that are resilient, more resilient or more vulnerable to, to climate change. And moving on, uh, I want to uh, introduce our works in the soil biodiversity. So here I'm talking about microbial diversity, micro microorganism as opposed to macro macrofauna that Jerome uh, talked previously. So I'm not a biologist, I'm not a microbiologist. So my colleague Vanessa Pino and others uh, know more about soil bi uh, microbial diversity. So I'm only here to present their work. So to understand how the microbes are distributed across Australia, and here is in terms of New South Wales, we conducted a survey. Uh, this is New South Wales, this is Australia. New South Wales is here, Sydney is somewhere here. And we conducted a survey, a transects around 10 kilometers each that we want to survey. Sorry, not 10, a thousand kilometers each. We want to survey what's happening with the microbial communities in the soil as a function of a different climate gradients and also soil gradients. So there's a, a sorry, yes, okay. So there's a temperature gradient and precipitation gradient. And also we have different types of information about the soil and elevation and so on. So the, the north, north to south, uh, south to north uh, gradient uh, represents a gradient in terms of a uh, temperature and the, and the east to west gradient represents the gradient in terms of a uh, rainfall. So at um, each of the sites, we collected uh, samples which are under natural vegetation and also under cropping vegetation. So at the end, we can calculate or we can see how the microbial diversity, this is the uh, Shannon index, therefore diversity, how does it the microbial, for example, fungi diversity uh, uh, along, the, along, the, uh, along the gradient here that uh, we as expected under natural ecosystem, uh, the diversity on the, on, of fungi diversity is higher than the cropping system but not always, and it also depending on the gradient of the latitudinal and longitude, longitude, which are due to uh, climate and also soil diversity. By doing that, we can now infer the bacterial beta, beta diversity in terms of the dissimilarity of the, the genome sequence, gene sequencing in terms of bacteria and fungi. And if we look at the better diversity of the bacteria or means the dissimilar bacteria, bacteria that are similar to each group. We can see that all of this beta diversity is uh, somehow related to the types of soil. So soil is a governing uh, how the bacteria uh, is distributed in the landscape. So finally, thank you. And uh, following on, uh, uh, Jerome said that as a for uh, the biodiversity contributed to the four, four SDGs. So here we argue that the soil should contribute to all 17 of the SDG. So thank you very much.